Okay. Or a okay. Okay. Uh, Basically, just told me that the bright lights will affect my eyes from now until I die. So I may have to wear glasses like Jeremy, or just squint. I hope I don't have to squint. Thanks, Jeremy. I don't think you want to wipe your eyes with them. No, I don't. They have you soap know. on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably more to clean your fingers after you eat your brown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where we need them, but if anybody needs one, there's one there. That's crazy. James, are we expecting other folks for this might, RDA discussion, or is it just you? I don't think we have any per se. Yeah, I don't think we're Okay, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, welcome to the Morgan County RDA board meeting, April 18th, 2023. We're convening as an RDA board. Uh, members of the commission are convening as an RDA board. We're going to talk about the history of the RDA um, in the county project area, project budgets, etc., and then discussion, decision on any potential revisions to the project area, county consultant budget, and local agreements, etc. Okay, we'll hand it over to you, James. Wonderful, thank you. So um, we had a great opportunity, and again, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know that there's other things on the agenda for this evening, for the commission meeting. 
Um, however, I think it's important for us to kind of get some background on where we are on a county perspective. Uh, we do have the initial draft for the Mountain Green Peterson area plan that will be coming to you fairly quickly. Um, I believe that Lance will uh, finish, uh, finish, finish up some details of it and we'll get it sent out. Uh, the reason I bring this plan up is a big component of this plan will be future development and how uh, from a county perspective we can help drive development to areas that the county plan or the eventual general plan with the adoption of the small area plans would, um, with appropriate planning, have development grow. And again, whether that's retail, commercial, uh, industrial, or residential. Um, the RDA is a tool that can be used by the county to help direct that type of growth. A lot of times we look at RDAs or CRAs um, as a tool that just developers use um, to help them, you know, finance a development. But the reality of it is it can be a tool that the county can use or a municipality can use to help direct where growth is. Um, sometimes we do that through zoning, but zoning has loopholes and others, uh, other things that sometimes, um, because you can't plan for every option of a development, um, that maybe sometimes development doesn't exactly occur how you would like it in a certain area that is zoned. Well, the RDA or a CRA uh, allows you a tool because it's a financial carrot that a developer can use um, to help maybe direct or dictate some things like architectural rendering or house density or commercial percentage. So say in a development agreement from the county's perspective, you say we want 15% commercial in this area. But the reality of it is, 10 years later when you're looking at it, you would like higher. Well, you could do an RDA requirement in that area for 30% commercial. And they don't have to use that, correct? But if they want to attain maybe some of the benefits of that TIF financing or that RDA financing, that would be something that would help encourage them to do those types of things. So there's a lot of reasons for RDAs. Again, I think we have some individuals, probably some commissioners that have, you know, maybe some background in, in uh, Commissioner McConnell. If there's something in here you want to pop in, please feel free. But I think it's an amazing tool from the county's perspective inside that we, we can use to help and not only um, provide the incentives for developers and good developers, but also provide the type of community that we're looking to build out. And again, having this eventual general plan and the adoption of the small area plans will help um, you as commissioners uh, provide the direction into those communities of the type of growth that you think that you'll need for a variety of reasons. And because this <laughs> report is 120 pages, I can't find the exact statistics, but uh, we went over this, I think, just the other night, and when we look at um, Morgan County, I think Morgan County has the second highest percentage um, of property tax that is uh, on the backs of single family dwellings in the entire state. So a majority, upwards of 90% or 95% of all the taxes collected, uh, property taxes, are for single family. Um, which basically means that your resident, your, your commercial base is so small um, and it's probably a little out of whack. And then I think that number is almost that same uh, percentage that these single family homes are almost all um, uh, dwellings. I mean, what, not, uh, not secondary homes, but primary homes. So what I guess I'm saying is that your residents, your primary residents that have single family homes are providing the property tax at a, at a very high rate because you have a very small commercial uh, base within the county. And so when you have citizens in here really frustrated with property tax, um, a majority of that reason isn't because, in my opinion, the county wastes a lot of money. I think the county is very frugal in its money. I just think that there's not a large enough base that isn't residential to help offset some of that. And that's why this uh, real focus on some quality commercial retail development, focusing in outdoor tourism and recreation will really help offset some of those um, some of that weight that your citizens continue to have to bear. Does that make sense? Did I explain that clear as mud to everybody? Okay. I got it. So, uh, thank you very much, Commissioner, <laughs> <Mr. laughs> <Mr. laughs> for acknowledging uh, that. 
Um, so, uh, in the past, I don't think and I don't believe that Morgan has really utilized RDAs or CRAs. Uh, right now, I think there is one that is worked its way somewhat through the process, but not all the way. Commissioner McConnell, did you, were you thinking there was possibly another one that was in the works besides the one in the Mount Green Town Center area? or? Um, we do have one here in city. Morgan City yes. that's, that's been in existence for quite some time. So and we've been actively participating perfect, in it. Perfect. So my, I guess my reference is is an RDA or CRA that is ran by this board, um, not one that is ran by another board, which would be the city running one, and you're participating. So yes, there is a participating in one for the city, but not one specific for the county and the, the, the commission slash RDA board is actually running it. So we're just a local taxing entity for purposes of the city. Of the city, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, do you feel like you know enough about RDAs and TIF, or do you should I go into it a little more deeper, conceptually? I have a question on that. Yes. If now so I'm not an expert, but I'll answer what I can, and then Robert will finish. So we do you still have your question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> on me I so, apologize um, we can set the amount of time for that like a 10 year or 20 year I know the the one over here might be 20 years I don't know uh, the RD, RDA here can we do multiple items within this RDA I mean how does that work entities that might want to utilize part of the RDA. You betcha. So no, normally how an RDA CRA process is put together, and I think that's something we need to talk about today is establishing a process, is that the, the uh, developer puts together an RDA area plan, and within that RDA area plan is a budget. That budget is then used um, or presented to the the board for review and the RDA budget actually has the time and span including a, an inception date or start date and the percentage needed of TIP uh, return to meet that eventual budget. So usually what you'll have is a long budget and it has all the numbers in it and it has all the years in it, right? Um, and then we'll have the percentage of the TIF and sometimes that percentage may have a step down or an increase, and those numbers then actually come to zero at the end that the amount of money needed to make that project work, let's say it's $1 million, at the end of 10 years, at this percentage, will then, then, then draw all this money down to the zero. Or, in other words, it will collect this million dollars at the end of this 10 years at 10%, based upon the TIF increase of the property value. Okay. And so, then what we then we'll work through a process of establishing what that tip what that tip can be used for and the purpose of it and they'll have to do justifications and the whole a whole kind of a business plan on what that looks like and how it works. It's a that's a very simple description. So what in is there and Robert might be able to tell us this, but what is it what's there that could possibly after ten years the company the business does not make it? and we've just lost all of that that we put into it, then what happens? Well, you haven't really lost it because a, a TIF is almost a post-performance, right? So as the property increases and the county is collecting more taxes, then a percentage of that is taken off and put back into the project. Does that make sense? So if it's a 50-50 over the time of that TIF up to the point you call, you're calling a failure, right? Um, you, you're still collecting 50% forever, and then if they fail and they, they bag, you have a clawback in it, which means you can pull that money back if there's a failure or there's a change of business or the model isn't working. You know, you can write those clauses into that agreement. There's, there's opportunities to have clawback. I'm calling it a clawback. Maybe there's a more appropriate term for it. Um, well, I, I think in part it, so if you look at what they gave us, which was the 2019 budget, and you had a list of items that's 18 items long. Right. 
most of that is related to infrastructure development. So if one developer came in and did that, and the budget was accurate, and they spent the $17.2 million to put all of that in. That's all there. That never goes away. Whether they succeed or fail, that never goes away. That infrastructure is there, and they don't get a reimbursed a dime until they've actually put it in. Okay. So if you go, that's a significant number, but let's say you went with a 17-year payback period as you budgeted it, you allocated your percentage um, of the TIF that, it, that they get. If they outperform, meaning that the value of the improvements in the project area exceed the value set forth in the budget, they'll get paid back more quickly, but they'll never get more than the $17.2 million they spent. If it underperforms and they get to the end and they haven't been fully reimbursed, most of the time that's their loss. So if during that 17 years it's a shopping center and tenants come and go and fail, it's irrelevant because it, the, the values generated on the basis of the taxable value of the property. I mean, I guess if you had no tenants, then the value would should technically come down if the assessors evaluate it based upon their leasehold revenues generated by the project. But overall, so but I don't. I don't know if that answered your question. Value, but right? over time, yeah, yeah in theory, they'll have a the base value, value. Is still there. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's just and it just allows another group to come in and take over the project if that's what what happens, or new tenants to take new spaces, and so forth. So, is there a relationship between RDA and rooftops? So, and it just seems like there's been multiple commercial businesses, and it doesn't matter if it's Mountain Green or up here in Morgan City, but they, they come in with uh, the flowery picture and really think that they can make this work, and it actually seems like the majority of them, it doesn't work <laughs> after a period of time. So do you see a relationship between what the RDA would do and not having enough, well, what most of them would say, enough rooftops or enough uh, people up here to actually warrant them staying afloat as a business? Yeah, so I think, again, it's something that we look at um, from the RDA board's perspective. Um, part of uh, their application will be to prove to the RDA board that it's a viable project. That's not me. Um, so I, th I think that's a component of it, but there is a component of RDAs, and I think particularly even we've had discussions lately that RDA many times is just for infrastructure, but there are opportunities in RDAs to, to uh, assist the developer in making it through some maybe lean times because there's a build out of rooftops. Um, maybe it's a supplement for lease um, a lease agreements to start out with. So if you look at your Lee's uh, grocery store, and we'll see this probably as soon as we can all go through um, the report. Right now there are about 1,000 to 15 homes under the rooftops needed for Lee's to make it. So they're going to have a couple lean years. So would it make sense for some of the RDA dollars to help offset some of those losses to help as those homes are built out? Again, that will be a proposal that the developer uh, or the applicant will have to, you know, have to make to the board, and the board will have to make a decision if, if that's the appropriate use in their eyes of those dollars. Um, however, to I think Commissioner McConnell's point, um, and to a business and economic development component that we always have to be aware of is that development sometimes take one or two owners to actually become successful. Um, and if we do use it for infrastructure, that infrastructure is still in the ground, is still viable. If something does happen to the developer, um, they still own the property, taxes are still uh, there to be paid, and tax increment is taken from the taxes that are paid by the property owners. Uh, and so they still have to pay those taxes at the end of the day. But again, um, I'll use Powder Mountain as an example. Um, Powder Mountain just went through some new ownership. And so um, there was a lot of angst when that initial um, 
project was kind of put together, but the money that is being used to uh, kind of um, continue to move that project forward because there was a it's a little different than a CRA, but to pay for that road is collected from the landowners within that project area. So I think that there's some built-in precautions and safeguards for the county um, because you're not really outlaying dollars that would not that, that would be in the general fund uh, if but for the property in, uh, value increased. Did that answer your question, Commissioner Anderson? Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Wilson, you're formulating a question, I think, or you're Googling something. I'm Googling I'm just, something. I'm just teasing you. <coughs> so con conceptually, I think that there is a lot of due diligence on the front end of CRAs, and we will have a conversation on how we do that here in a second, hopefully. Um, but I do believe that they're a strong tool that can be used by the, by the municipality or by the county to help direct um, appropriate and planned development. And it can be a tool that can be even a little more um, directive than your regular zone if they want to take advantage of that tool. So this was created back in 2019. Yes. It looks like they came up with a project area, a project area plan, and a project area budget. I don't know that any of those were actually finalized and adopted other than the creation of the project area. I agree. So that came to an end <laughs> in terms of an, an initiative. Um, I'm assuming the project area continues to exist. Although, in my looking at the map, I think I might want to, to alter that, or it might be advisable to alter that, um, to pick up the commercial areas on the other side of the old highway. Um, so what would be our process for doing that? Just is it, do we need to, I guess I'm asking the question, do we need to start over in terms of a project area plan and budget, or can we amend these? The budget's clearly going to be out of date. <laughs> so, and I'm not an expert in this area, and I can go do more research, but from what I understand, I think it can be amended rather than starting over. And so that's why the materials were included in the packet was to say, this is where it was left off, and we haven't met for three well, how long have we been? Probably three years? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. Um, and so it kind of came to that halt. Rather than, you know, adopting another ordinance to establish the RDA, I think we would just look at where it stopped and decide, is it something you want to continue? And if so, how? Maybe it needs to be amended, or I guess you could scrap it and start over too. I, I don't think that you're limited to one or the other. Okay. But from what I understand, you have the option to amend. So you could dissolve the project area and have them start again, or to um, Garrett's point, our county attorney's point, um, I think we could just do an amended, uh, just re request them to amend the area, including the uh, budget of the project area. So uh, typically these things are funded by an applicant in terms of updating maps and budgets and preparing them. So I guess what I'm just wanting to make sure we're in a position to do is to respond to an applicant if there were an applicant to come in and say, we want to use tax increment funding. I think Lee's Marketplace is one that may be considering that. Um, are we in a position then, I guess, just to say, okay, we've got the RDA in place, project area, we think that it may need to be amended, but we're amenable to going through that process with you as you fund the, the you know, map amendment and budget process and so forth. I think that that would be the desire of those that, that want to move this forward. And um, I think, as far as I understand the history, it was being funded, and they hired. You yeah. have to remind me the group. Smith, yeah, I can't remember the Smith, group. Uh, Har Smith Harvickson. Yeah, Harvickson. Yep, that one to to kind of help. And 
I think it was disappoint. Well, I don't know. I, I wasn't there, but from what I gathered, they said it doesn't look like the RDA board is in favor of this at this point. They're not looking. Doesn't look like they'll approve the proposed budget, and so it kind of dropped at that point. But I. From the meeting that we had earlier, I think that there are some stakeholders that are interested in picking that up again and putting in, you know, the the money that it would take to get a new proposal and maybe just uh, some direction from the commission or maybe testing the water of is this something or not the commission, the RDA board, is this something that is is available and then there would also be a negotiation process where they come in with a proposal and we say no that's too you know we can't do that much but maybe we can come in at this percentage and there's still some negotiation that could be worked out but I think the, the stakeholders or those that are interested in pursuing this are more looking for is this still on the table has the the feeling of the RDA board changed since two and a half years ago where perhaps this could move forward and, and then if so they'll put some investment into updating the, the area, the budget, and and let that negotiation take place of what is you know, what are the numbers gonna actually look like. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of calculations that go into it that I, that I don't fully understand. I, I'm kind of getting fire hose, you know, okay, this, this is the concept, this is how it could work. Um, but I think that was another thing that probably James is going to bring up as well, that the county might, um, you know, rely on someone who's an expert in this field to kind of consult the county too to make sure that we're getting a really good um, agreement in place as far as percentages and how long it lasts and clawbacks or whatever it, it's it's called in those types of agreements. So I know Commissioner Wilson spoke for all of us when he said we understand, but I don't think I do all the yeah. way. <laughs> And I'll be honest, I, I think unless you spend a lot of time in this, there's, we've got, so there's a couple things I wanted to talk about, Commissioner, sorry to cut you off, but I do think we're going to have, if, if we understand that development is coming, and there are going to be requests for RDAs or CRA overlays and project areas, we've got to have somebody who understands these well enough to make sure that the contracts we sign I mean, this is the issue we have with our broadband, one of our broadband contracts. We've got to have somebody who knows enough about it that can make sure every T is crossed, every I is dot. Conceptually, what we're looking for is reflected in the contract. The state just did a, a, a pretty large um, review and audit of the RDAs and came back with some very negative findings for many of the RDAs that are out there. They're not being checked, they're not being ran, the money's not being spent appropriately, and so we've the RDA, ha the RDA has the ability to write within the agreement of 5 to 10 percent administrative cost from the county side to, to review it and to run it, because they actually have to be run. You just, don't, you just don't approve an RDA, and then you never see it anymore, right? So the money has to be coming in, the money turns over to you, the board. So say it's a million dollars a year, but well, you're going to get that million dollars a year for these five projects. Somebody's got to be checking all these projects to make sure every agreement with the or stipulation within those agreements has been met before that check's being written. And probably you probably want to have somebody that bi yearly or quarterly is just double checking to make sure those things are quarterly happening. And that money comes from the state? No, that money will come fr from the RDA board through the agreements. So say we give a million dollars in from the RDA over a course of a period of time and you write in a two or three percent, just like you do in a grant for oversight, well that will be the dollars that you can use to either hire or consult or whatever, somebody to be checking all these things to make sure, or work with Garrett to make sure the legal requirements are being met, making sure that the money's being spent in the appropriate manner. And so to your, and then hopefully that person also is the same person then 
who can help formulate at the front end these agreements to make sure that everything and stipulations the county needs in there are written in the agreement correctly. So, can I ask my question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I may cut you off and answer one. <laughs> yeah. I guess. As a politician, I can answer a question that has nothing to do with what you I said. I had no idea you were a politician. <laughs> um, I, I knew you were. So, if this is an example for us, and this is, and let, let's just, for sake of understanding it better, it's uh, 17 million. Um, we've got an area, let's say Leagues Market is inside this area. So, just understanding it, it basically, that what's going to help Lee's Market is they're not going to be paying as high of taxes because we're going to set up incrementally how yeah. that's going to work initially. So they, it, it wouldn't what, be they're not what, paying as high of taxes. They still what's pay their benefit? It. They yeah. still pay it. They still pay the, the tax rate. Then out of that tax rate, say that $100,000 that's collected out of the same tax rate that everybody else is paying, they have a 10% return that comes back to them from the county back to the RDA board, from the RDA board back to the developer to use in the manner that you stipulated they can use it. Maybe lease, maybe lease assistance, it could be infrastructure, it could be water, it could be a, a number of things. So, so it really, the benefit to the county would be, because it's not money-wise, it doesn't sound like it's going to be a benefit per se. What, what we're doing is we're helping create a mechanism where commercial can come in and be built and, and get, get on their feet. And then what we're saying initially is, hey, we're going to give back a, a certain, certain percent. Certain percentage, yes, sir. Um, we're not going to be able to use that in our in our general budget, which we desperately need. Yeah. But well, you can use you can use the increment that you don't give them. So say it's a 50-50, sure. you get that 50 sure. percent of the increase; they get the other 50 percent or whatever. Sure. And, and the so. way I've heard it explained a lot of times is you're taking that ba that base year amount, right? So let's say that property right now we're getting ten thousand dollars a year in property taxes on. They're going to come in, they're going to build structures that are worth, I don't know how many millions, but now the tax rate's going to be $100,000 a year on that. On that, So the increment is 100000 Of that 100000 sorry, 90000 Start at 10. 90000 okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the increment is 90000 Let's say we're going to give 50% of that back through the CRA. So 45000 of that goes back through the CRA to help encourage that initial investment. Yep. The other 45 comes to the county. Yeah, the other 55. So you always get your base. You'll always get Sorry, your base. Sorry, 55 change yet. plus the base. Yeah. So, so, there's, so there's who, who, who the benefits county. the most out of this whole thing? Well, that depends on the name. So look. Depends I, on how you look at it. <laughs> I've, done, I've done these. The, he's talking 50%. This proposal here, I believe, was 76%. I've done them where the... the uh, RDA is given all of it back to the development entity, Initially. except for their administration fee. Initially. Yeah, for the course of for time. The course of the time if, if, if this had been approved back in 2019, the, the basic raw value of the ground over that period of time has incrementally gone up. You would be generating more increment just on the basis of the value of the ground and no improvements have been put in. But over the long term, the community develops because once you get to the end of that repayment period, whatever we set that at, 15, 7, 21 years, whatever it is, then all of that increment, all of that increased value, plus the sales tax generated by the economic enterprise that's there, goes to the community. But in the short term, more often than not, most of the benefit goes to the development. So then we're, under your scenario, here with the city, we're giving them 75% right now. Of the county's portion. Of the county's portion. Mm -hmm. So when do we see a return other than increased value? Once the reinvestment period, or the so. reimbursement period ends. Then and that I, I guess you could argue for the city down. specifically, one of the things they did was that hotel. Mm -hmm. So well, the return uh, that we're the, seeing is also in the I think in the, scenarios in the, in the, the taxes that are coming. Yeah, out. we've the got transient occupancy tax, tax that's being generated from that. 
Yep. Now, sales. these things can also involve reimbursement, like taking a reimbursement portion of the sales tax if you want to. And there's state incentives that can be utilized to do all of this. You have to be decidedly in favor of developing the area for commercial development that you're talking about here. When, when we had our last rezone in where we had all of the public opposition, one of the things that they wanted were improvements to the old highway, lane expansion, you know, traffic control and all of that sort of thing. Well, that was a significant portion of this budget, at, at least through, a, you know, a significant area of the old highway. And, you know, is that all, is all of that increased volume attributable to this development? Perhaps. And if that were the case, you would say, well, you shouldn't be reimbursed for it. That should just be a project improvement for your project. Or does it, is it needed generally to handle the overall volumes that are being generated by development in the whole Mountain Green area in this case? And in that case, it's a project, a system improvement, and we ought to be amenable to allowing them to be reimbursed for that. So, so that can be a benefit, the improvement of the... I mean, if you look at the list of improvements that were being done, that's the material benefit you get up front as the jurisdiction. It, it's almost as if if we don't do the RDA and, and commercial is, are struggling to, to stay afloat here, uh, we might we wouldn't possibly even see it anyway then. Or, or what you have is this commercial growth that's unstructured. And so if we're looking from a community perspective of open space, planned areas, and again, Josh, help me out a little bit if I misspeak. But if there's a way that we can have a tool that helps create viability in a planned area for commercial, and even though there may be a hurdle or two to jump over, but that tool allows us to get that growth to happen in that area, that, that's it, you know, to Robert's point, that's more of a system approach rather than an unplanned the viability of maybe something will work here and then two miles down the road something will hurt work here, right? Because they're closer to a residential or closer to a residential instead of having a planned community and now we're concentrating it in one area and then the rest of the community is still open and still rural and still feels like Morgan. And so, again, I think the answer I would give to you is there's a huge financial benefit short term and long term. Even 25% even of that TIF for a period of time on property that would sit, sit fallow. Fallow? Fallow. Thank you. Um, there what, would be what word did you just say? Fallow. Fallow. I, I say it with a Utah accent, so it comes out weird when I say it. Um, but that, that, the increase in that value, you'll still incur, even if it's not the 100%, but it's 100 per, it's 50% it's of something instead of 0% of nothing. Um, and then this idea that it actually is used as a tool to help drive your growth to areas within your plan. So I think there's three positives for the county. Of course, there's a positive for the developer. That's how we're trying to get them to develop, right? Uh, but I do think there's huge, there's huge positives for the community and for the county. James, so. taking this, this example, they've got a $17 million budget, but let's say they come in with that. That doesn't mean that the RDA has to generate $17 million. That's just their overall cost, correct? Well, what they'll come in with is they'll come in with the cost of the project. Uh, they'll also come in with understanding the budget that they need to make the project work. And then they'll use what the money that they feel is that they, that they need to help span that shortfall. And then they'll put it uh, against their budget and say, for this many years, we need this percentage of what we see the growth of the value of this property to offset that number. And then we, to Garrett's point, we'll have discussions on whether we need to, we think that's, you know, if we bring the right person in, they can look at the numbers and see if, you know, uh, the market value of that will grow, if their timeline, I, again, I think another thing to the last question is, if we have a quicker start date, then we can kind of dictate to them, listen, you need to get this project going, because every year they don't start the project is one year less in their time in their timeline. Does that make sense? And so I think, you know, that's another tool that you can use to help maybe move a project forward a little quicker than normally it would. So. Am I the only one freezing to death? It's a little it chilly. It's a lot chilly.
Like I've got cold air blowing on me almost. Uh, yeah, I know. So, so Commissioner there. Anderson, would you just scoot your chair closer? <laughs> <laughs> he wants a hug. Bo body heat. <laughs> so to understand, just to make sure you're, you're clear on where the funds come from, this is just property tax that's collected. It's collected by our assessor. And then if the RDA has allocated a portion to a project area, it's paid to the RDA and distributed. And it involves, we only control... So is that a budget line on our budget every year? Well, the RDA will have a budget. Yeah, but where does that, that money's coming from us, so is that a well, yeah, line we would, item no, budget because we, would, we wouldn't be receiving it. Ever. It wouldn't be going to the general fund because we've said, presumably, if you do this, that the portion of the increment that the increment generated by Mountain Green Town Center project is going to be funded to the RDA. It's like it's like if you have a fire district, the money comes into the county, the county sends money to the special districts, it never goes into your general budget. The money would go into the RDA before, it, it doesn't go to your general budget now. If I recall correctly, it should go from the, um, the, clerk, the clerk's office, clerk's office? And then it will go, just like a special district, go right to the RDA budget. But I guess what I'm saying is that it, it robs some of the in, income. It, yeah, it yes, certainly yes. reduces yep. the overall income that you would otherwise get if there was no RDA. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And then the other taxing agencies need to consent if if they want to participate. So it's not all just us. So the school, the school district, district has portion. the largest portion. If the school district consents to a portion of their increment going towards the development of this project, then portion of their increment. The other, all of the taxing agencies have to consent and the county goes and negotiates interlocal agreements with them in order to secure that consent over the long term. And then the other agreement that is done is the reimbursement agreement with the developer which is where you identify what percentage of the increment they, they get, what's their reimbursement period. Um, Usage. Yeah, usually you've specified exactly what they get reimbursed for. So that's the way it works. So how, I mean, if, say for instance, their sales tax is only 10000 I don't know how much their taxes would be. Say it's only $10,000, then how do they get enough money to work this project out? Well, first of all, this has nothing, this budget and, and what was proposed before had nothing to do with sales tax. Sales tax is an additional thing that could no, be sent their direction. Tax. You meant real property, property tax. Yeah, yeah there, I mean, that's what, when you look at the bu budget, I mean, th this, is just the, this is just the budget for the improvements. This is not the RDA budget. Um, the RDA, they would show on a pro forma, we're going to spend... 17 million dollars on infrastructure and we're going to spend another 90 million dollars in putting the project in so we have a 107 million dollar project that's currently farmland it's it's got a value but it's it's not 107 million dollars so that all that property tax generated on that increment is what goes to create a funding source to repay back a portion of the cost they put into the project that's infrastructure related or whatever else we approve. Actually, the purposes that you can use it for are actually fairly broad, but most of them relate to something like this. And, and sometimes commission board. slash planners slash uh, RDA boards will want to have an area of focus on something. So maybe this makes sense for or for a lease assistance. Maybe this one makes more sense for infrastructure, uh, overcoming barriers for infrastructure costs. So I, again, I think that's negotiable within the board and within the conventional RDA agreement. So, and if if this had been done, let's say, and then somebody, a tenant comes in, a grocery store tenant, and they say, we don't think we can make it unless we get a portion of the increment. Well, we've already awarded the increment to the developer, but the tenants, large tenants are not shy about saying, we want a portion of the increment that you're receiving pursuant to your agreement, and they would do that pursuant to a separate agreement.
So like Josh has a point to me. I would also add that something like this, the goals, objectives, and the action implementation strategies for this type of thing would be added into your general plan in the economic development section. So it's clear this is the intent of the RDA is to encourage X type of development or encourage the development in this area. Right. And an economic development section in your general plan would have nodes of development where these types of agreements would be uh, considered. And then the general plan would include goals, objectives, and then implementation strategies to bring about these types of agreements. They'd be general in nature. Nothing specific. So to me, an answer with respect to moving forward with this really comes down to your commitment to developing a town center area in Mountain Green where we've indicated that a town center <laughs> ought to be. Because, I mean, I was on the other side of this deal the last time we went through this developer funded their legal counsel which was me they funded the county's legal counsel they funded the te the the cost to do the budgets and so forth and then it was just like really for no identified reason that I recall that was substantive it was we don't want to do it <laughs> and it, it's like well that would have been nice to know before you started us off on this massive expenditure of funds, you know. So that, that's, that's where, again, I'm saying we need to be committed to doing this or, or we shouldn't lead the development community down the primrose path of suggesting that we are having them spend the funds. Because like I said, typically they're funding the cost of the, I'm, I'm pretty sure Smith Harvison's bill was paid for by the developer. So so I thought I when I saw this that it was approved. So there was a resolution Just the area approved for the area plan. Um, and that was approved in 2017 as I read yeah. it. Okay, yeah, that's true. Year. And then in 2019 was the last time yeah. as I recall we convened as an RDA board and, and had and any discussion. And can I just I want to reaffirm Commissioner McConnell, McConnell's point. Um, we've spent time uh, trying to put this together. Garrett has spent time. Josh has, has spent some time in probably thinking about it. Um, we have interested parties that are ready to move forward. Uh, but what I don't want to do is move forward and then move back two spaces because that's not good for us. If, if the RDA board is not at a point where they're ready to move forward on this, then I say we just keep sitting on it rather than having people come and expense time, effort, and energy. Um, both the CEO board and the small area plan recommendations both ha ha heavily recommend uh, the RDA board moving forward in areas. And then uh, again, to Josh's point, we need to write that into the general plan, have those areas designated. Um, and then we need to, if we're ready then, and the commitment's there, we want to start using this tool, that we need to come up with a good process. And I have some suggestions on a process. I've sent them to Garrett. Um, and then we need to bring somebody on board um, that really can be the person to make sure that your your real questions are answered in a real manner that really helps you and that you have confidence that the RDA is set up in a manner that protects the county to the fullest and it's bulletproof. Um, but the first step is really getting the RDA board to say, listen, I think we need to use this tool and we're really willing to start um, implementing a process and then start having some, some applications come in. So since you two were here back in this time period, how did the community receive this? Was it? I don't um, recall that we had any public input. Do really? you remember? No, I don't remember a lot other than Tina. Um, she was here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there wasn't like and, a public and hearing. I, and the only thing I remember in it. terms of a conversation with Tina is on the percentage that they were requesting. Percentage because the and the time. Yeah. Period. So so you know that that is the fundamental thing you're negotiating. What percentage of the increment did they get, and how long is their reimbursement period? And my view, 
was that 76% was a low ask compared to all of the other ones that I've done. And I don't want to suggest I've done 50 of them. I've done maybe 10 of them. But the ones I have done, you know, it's like, yeah, we'll take all of it other than your administrative fee. And, you know, but that's a decision that needs to be made between the county and the applicant and and the, it's the jurisdiction's view of how important the project is you know if it's unimportant and the improvements are questionable you know you don't really want it then yeah i'm not, I'm not giving you 76 percent or 95 percent or 50 percent i'm not going to do it so but i don't remember there being any big public hearing where there were a lot of people so was it ever even voted on then it was it was whether we were going to proceed or not. And I'll be honest, I, I voted against it at the time, and my hang-up was the time frame, because as I recall, they wanted 20-plus years or 25 years, and the 70, and the percentage. And I was of the opinion that it ought to be a lower percentage in a shorter time period, because I wanted a little more benefit for the community. The other reason I voted against it at the time was because the, the council at the time couldn't even coalesce around support of the interchange, let alone this, and I just saw it as being a fight moving forward, and I didn't want to go down that road. Uh, you know, so we want to provide you with the answers to your questions from somebody that is representing the county so that you feel comfortable, because sometimes where you were getting your answers was from the developer and the developer's team, and so I think we need to have somebody that can, you can ask a question to, and you feel like they have the county's best interest in mind when they say, no, a 17-year, once a year, that doesn't work. Or 17 years, as I've reviewed this, does seem like the appropriate time to move this project forward. So I, I think that may also help and alleviate some of the angst if we get the right person that you feel very comfortable with. Well, and, and keeping track in our minds is who represents who, because there were members on the council at the time who couldn't keep track of which lawyers were standing up and which ones represented the counties and which ones represented the developer. <laughs> yes, that was true too. And there was a sentiment by some that they didn't get reimbursement for their business, so why should anybody else? Look, the RDA has been effective in Morgan City to bringing that hotel. That hotel would not have come to fruition had it not been for an RDA in Morgan City. I'm, I'm convinced of that because there just wasn't enough support to, to make that kind of investment without some kind of, you know, help. Whether, whether you know, a, a huge investment is necessary, I don't know. So my personal thought is, again, I'm still not real comfortable with huge percentages and real long terms. I'd rather see a little shorter and, and you know, but are there ways to use this as a tool to the county's advantage? Yeah, absolutely. I think there are. And and maybe maybe if we speak with somebody who can represent us and give us some real good detail, maybe we can come up with some ways to incentivize the exact type of development we want instead of just a broad development. I don't because that's another thought. Because one of the, the focus of the CRA in Morgan became the hotel, and they, they were working towards just that that developed. They tried doing rent assistance on Commercial Street for a long time, many years, and businesses would come in, they'd pay their rent for two or three years, and then as soon as the city stopped paying the rent through the, well it wasn't the city, as soon as the RDA stopped paying the rent, the business would go out of business, they couldn't stay afloat. So sometimes that's a good thing, but other times it's not. Then they, they changed and said, well we're going to use the RDA funds to make improvements to the, to the buildings there, so that it costs the landlord less to be able to rent it to somebody, and hopefully they can rent it at lower rates, and that's been a little more effective. And then they, they you know, worked on the hotel thing. So can it be used as a tool? Yeah, it's just another tool in the toolbox. But could it, could it be, you know, more benefit to the developer than to the county? Yeah, for sure. So the way, the way I look at the time and, and reimbursement percentage is, what the pro forma shows, the pro forma shows, and as they estimate what they're going to develop, they're taking a risk setting that out on paper because if they don't develop it fast enough, they'll run out of period, okay? So I'm like, let them take that risk, and what I want to decide is which improvements will I authorize to reimburse them. Once I've done that and said, okay, I'm going through this list, and I'm like, okay, 
I, I see the importance of the highway improvement, but I, I'm not worried about the culinary water and the secondary water companies. They're private. Let them develop that and work on that out. I take that out. Everything else, I look at the pro forma. And if it takes 76% in 17 years to reimburse them for what I think they ought to be reimbursed for, so be it. I'm not, I'm not concerned about the percentages otherwise because all I'm looking at is the math, all right? Their, their pro forma, based on their estimate, is going to be that they're going to develop X, Y, and Z over the next 10 years, and if they do X, Y, and Z, in addition to putting these improvements, they could be reimbursed at 76% over 17 years for the improvements I've authorized. If that's what it is, okay, that's fine with me, you know? And if they outperform, we get money faster. If they underperform, they don't get fully reimbursed. Yeah, because at the end of the term, they're done, whether they got reimbursed or not. That's right. So I don't, you're just yeah, trying, basically so, trying to come to an agreement. Yeah, it's, it's entirely negotiated. Because it doesn't, the math is the math in the end. Right, right. So to me, that's where I make that decision, Mike, as opposed to... And that's an interesting... Because to me, it's like the percentage, like, I've seen them, like I said, all the way up to the entire thing. Well, and the and, problem with that and is that, that data center was highly wanted by that jurisdiction. If you're well, just looking guess, at the number and you the give other. them a number, they could cut out things that you prioritized in there, right, to make that number work. So I think this a la carte kind of concept where you're picking and making and prioritizing, and then whatever the number is, it is a smart idea. Because if, if you just give them a number, they could cut back things that you think, okay, well, we really wanted a hotel here. Well, that's not going to work because the numbers, right? So... And do we have a say on what the facades look like and all that stuff? Or? Yeah, that's already been done for the for the town center zone yeah. district. Yeah, so it's going to be uniform, not it's, it's not like Morgan. There's design well. standards and the whole bit. <laughs> you couldn't say you 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 could say that it will be developed in accordance with a consistent standard. Uniformity isn't necessarily going to result from that, but they should be similar. If you go look at I mean, our, we have block, we have metal, we have... Yeah. It's very specific. If, if you go look in our code at the town center ordinance and the, and the town center zoning structure, it's, it goes through all of that. It even has pictures of what is and is not acceptable. It's pretty detailed. Okay. So one other thing that came out of the meeting that we were in with a couple others that are more familiar with the RDAs, was this concept of not only setting a percentage for a certain amount of years, but you could also set a threshold to say reimbursement at X amount. And if you hit it in 12 years, you're reimbursed. And maybe that would make some on the commission feel more comfortable. It's like, okay, there's a cap or, you know, once we hit this, if we outperform everything, well, that's good for the business because they're bringing in lots of business they're getting reimbursed what they expected to at that amount and then maybe I mean they're still bearing the risk because after 17 years it drops off if they're not fully reimbursed well now they're left holding the bag a little bit but it kind of takes the risk from the county of saying well you're also not gonna you know take more than what was anticipated from the taxpayers because once you hit this threshold even if it's at the 12 year mark for the next five years you've been reimbursed. So maybe that would be a negotiated yeah. you know, way you to... Could, you yeah, could put a clause in there that if the property is sold, there can be a review. The RDA has the ability to review the entire agreement to make sure they're still fair and equitable. I mean, there's lots of things we can put in there to protect the county for sure. But I just want to make sure that we're in a good space, that if uh, we'll start, to, we'll, we'll put a process together. Um, I think the process will start with... Um, a survey area proposal on LOI that we'll review from a county perspective. We'll have a review of that, and then if there's a want to move forward, then they'll come with a survey area resolution. Um, and if that is approved through resolution, then we'll start the process of them coming back and proposing the budget um, and, and all the review of that. And then we'll go through the whole process of the public hearings and then all those types of things. But I think I want to start a process where they have to give us a proposed letter of an intent and a proposed area for us to look at even before we get to the board. Um, and then we'll, if there's an agreement to continue to move forward, if it meets to Josh's point that there's some certain requirements that it has to meet, then we can start the actual more formalized process. So 
but so as far as deciding if it's if we give them basically back on sales tax that's our decision or is that something we set up within the RDA that we're not going to or we're going to so I think all those will be proposals that would just come back uh, okay. for a review they'll be part of the agreement I'm so I think we're giving back sales tax they, that was not out of their pocket to begin with yeah Commissioner McConnell do they usually do they do sales to the sales tax request in the RDA or is that a separate agreement I'm not sure. I, can. I think it would come through the RDA, okay. but it may require a separate interlocal agreement to okay. get that arranged. And that's usually more operational than reimbursement of infrastructure completion. You know, and you, and you may have a grocery store tenant that thinks they need operational assistance, and it could be for a different period of time than the infrastructure reimbursement. And frankly, it's for a different person because the development entity is typically going to do the infrastructure work and the tenant's going to be putting in and paying for their building and all their fixture and equipment and employees and all of that kind of thing. So, but I think they would both be approved under the auspices of the RDA. Okay. Questions? Are we, are we, are we so, comfortable at least moving forward then? So I guess to, yeah, that's the question I want to, I'm comfortable moving forward with it. I'm comfortable moving forward with it. Okay. I'd like to definitely learn more and okay. understand that. Well, I'll try to bring somebody in that can work, uh, come to work session and explain a little better than me, um, but if we're comfortable, then I, I, I just, if there's huge hesitations right now, we're not ready, I don't want to waste anybody's time, but if it, it seems like we're in a good spot, so I'll start getting the wheels moving okay. forward, and, and we've got to get a process, and I'll work with Josh a little bit on some of those project area designs, even though we may not get it in before our first or second application. Um, but at least we'll be working off the same page. Um, and then I'll put forward a proposal. Um, Commissioner McConnell, can I send that proposal to you on what the process will look like? For a sure. Maybe we can work through that a little bit uh, along with Commissioner Fackrell. Um, and I and did that, look at look on the statute. It looks like we can amendment, amend it depending on what the nature of the amendment is. It, it depends. It triggers public hearings and interlocal. We don't have any existing interlocal agreements. So. Is there, is there a thought on who is like really a guru on this? Um, so I have somebody who I feel very comfortable working with, and I feel like he's done this for a tremendous period of time and has done a bunch of them. Um, but but again, I don't know how. If if you want to work it under my contract, I could probably figure that out easy. If you want to go outside of the contract, we probably have to RFP it. So I think that's a conversation we'll, we can have. But. But at least I know what direction to kind of head up on now, and I appreciate your time, even though we ran a little bit long. Um, I, and here you said me? it was going to be done in 30 minutes. I did, I did, because <laughs> I had a meeting at 4.30. <laughs> That's <laughs> nice, my fault. I talked too much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. We will adjourn as the Morgan County RDA Board. Do you, does anybody need a very quick break? Yeah. Too many this time. I need a little break. Take a very quick break and then we'll convene as the Morgan County Commission.
Commissioner. At the very end of the hour from now. So you can come back after your orchestra or whatever it is. If you want to. We, we might. We won't, we won't be there. Hopefully we're not. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We're going to call this meeting to order. <laughs> Where's your gavel? <laughs> yeah, where's my gavel? Um, Thanks for turning the heat up. <laughs> yeah, you okay? it was very cold. Yeah. Are you okay? I was cold. Mike, yes. just out of curiosity, my office. can we have an update from the sheriff during, because it's not on the still still Can we do that, or do uh, we have to make an amendment to, to the worse, agenda? Yeah, no, we can, we can do that. We'll just... Okay. I was like uncomfortable, like I was thinking. Okay, about we're going to commence our Morgan County Commission meeting April 18th, 2023. It's about 10 minutes after 5. We will begin with an invocation or moment of reflection and pledge of allegiance. And Commissioner Wilson is offered to do that. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful this evening for the blessings that we have and we enjoy. Thankful for the opportunity to serve this community. We're thankful for the members of our community. We're especially thankful for all those who have so graciously and willingly um, taken of their own time and, and resources to help the flooding victims and help our community through this process. We pray that uh, we can continue to have the weather that we have been blessed with to bring the water down slowly we are grateful for the water, and we're thankful, Father, for the blessing of um, living in such a great community. We pray that thy spirit will be with us this evening, help us to make good decisions, help us to think clearly in the things that we say and do. And we pray for the, all the members of this community, that they'll be watched over and protected. We're grateful for our freedoms. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Wilson. We'll go to our consent items. We have just one item this evening, that is the approval of the April 4th, 2023 meeting minutes. Are there any adjustments to the minutes that have not yet been provided to Julie? I'm sorry, since I did not get a chance to look at it till today, because it didn't come to me till today. I say let's postpone it till next time, unless they're totally accurate from what anybody else has read. Could look at them quick. I had. Yeah, they were. They weren't in the packet. Right? They weren't in the packet, and they didn't get here till today. Well, there's a version in the packet, but I think you made updates to it after that version, correct? No. No, the one in the first packet that went out, there wasn't. Oh, it's in the yeah, second we, packet. The second packet. Okay. Yeah, so I was going to say, I, yeah, I'm seeing it in the packet. I know you sent a separate email with just the minutes as well. Yes. Okay. And that should have all been done that night. There was an item in here that you had some question marks on. Which one was it? I couldn't hear. I, no. Actually, I don't think you, you said the Department of Something. You, UAC, so Blaine, it was from your comments. The 30th of March, Blaine met with UAC and U.S. Department of Something and spoke about money available through the Energy Block Grant. Right. Let's see. Department of Energy, is that what that is? U.S. Department of... I'm not sure. So, sure I wasn't okay. sure on that. Homeland so Security. <laughs> I don't remember it. Let me look. <laughs> so, 
on action item number four, um, the postponed planning and development, just on the motion where it says, until such time that the applicant has the will serve letter, and instead of say, saying which it can be, to say and, and it can be rescheduled at the next available meeting. It was the EECBG DAQ. So whoever that was. Can say that one more time? <laughs> EECBG. Economic Energy, probably. Community Building Grant, or whatever they are, the CB CBGs. CBG. Was Isn't it G that the end or D? G, as in GOAT. In and, item and seven, then, you might want to oh. say seconded by Commissioner Wilson as opposed to just seconded by Wilson. Sorry, didn't mean it. Oh, Julie, that would be Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant. Okay, thank How's you. How's that sound, Blaine? That sounds Commis right. Sorry, okay, Commissioner Fackle. That's fine. You can call me Blaine. <laughs> call me whatever sorry, you want. <laughs> oh, you're fine. I've been called lots worse yeah. than that. <laughs> <laughs> Under seven... You know, Commissioner Fack will move to postpone this item of the use of the gun range until a later date when we have more criteria put in together. I think it should just be put together. Put together. Question on number nine. Uh, Commissioner McCall moved to approve the agreement with Applicant Pro existing software to add background checks to our portal for, for hiring an I will further. Who's the I? Okay, so Robert will further recommend that we do background checks. Okay. That would be Commissioner McCall. Okay. And JPAC is JPAC. That's all I see in the minutes. Okay. I'll make a motion that we approve. Uh, April 4th, uh, 2023 meeting minutes as presented and with noted changes. Second. Okay, we have a motion to approve as amended. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Declarations of conflicts of interest for commissioners on any item on tonight's agenda. Okay, seeing none, we will move to our public comment period an opportunity for the public to address the commission. Please come forward and state your name for the record. Tina Kelly, Mountain Green. Um, I've been working on a project with someone and I've been researching code and making a link to the code. I know there have been changes made, you guys make changes all the time, but there have been changes made recently, and I don't think the online code is up to date. That, to me that's a little bit worrisome, and I, it could, for you guys it could cause liability issues, but for me, I like to know before I tell somebody how to proceed that I'm giving them correct information. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Josh. Josh, maybe you can look into that for us if you don't mind. It's, it's on my desk. Okay. It's on my desk. You've got it. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no additional public comment, I'm going to break from our agenda just very briefly and ask our sheriff to, 
just come up and give us any update he might have on our current flooding situation. Do you have anything you'd like to share, Sheriff? No, everything right now is pretty much taken care of. Our citizens are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Everything seems to be all in line with the weather. Awesome. So you will discuss the other thing during... You want to do that now? Well, I'm just curious. We're going to be discussing it during uh, uh, number seven. I think it's number seven. Okay, then I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. okay. Until then, thank you. All right, we'll move to our presentation. We have representatives from Weber Basin Water Conservancy District here to address us. Come on up. for having us. I appreciate the time to come and talk to you today. Um, we just wanted to give you a quick update on our water supply um, and kind of the flood control we're doing right now to try to mitigate um, what's going to be coming down from all that snowpack we've got up in the mountains right now. Do you want to introduce yourselves to oh, us yes. really quick? Sorry. Uh, my name is Riley Olson. I'm the water supply and power department manager with Weaver Basin Water. And John Perry, assistant general manager. Thank you. Riley yep. and John. Yeah, so just to start off, this is just um, kind of a look at where we are um, with the reservoirs right now. The, the capacity there of each of the reservoirs is shown in that uh, second column from the left. Um, as you can see, we've got about 549,000 acre feet of capacity. Um, current storage, we're about 274,000 um, acre feet, which is about 50% of capacity. Um, as many of you are probably aware, we've been dumping the reservoirs or releasing them from the reservoirs very hard over the past month, month and a half or so. Um, just in anticipation of all that snowpack um, running off into the reservoirs um, and trying to mitigate uh, flooding problems as much as we can at this point. Um, here's just a quick graphical view of um, the reservoirs. These are the, the reservoirs we have on the Ogden River. Um, in these graphs, the blue dashed line is the five-year average um, where the reservoirs typically are. The red line is last year and the black line is where we are this year. Um, so here at Kazi, you can see we started uh, releasing um, water pretty hard um, in mid-March or so. Uh, we dropped it pretty good, um, and then just with the warming over the past couple of weeks or so, um, we did see a, an upturn in that. The inflow um, with the runoff started to overtake what we were releasing, um, and then with the cooler temperatures over the past few days, we started to drop again, so it's good to see. Um, and in Pine View, again, about mid-March, we started uh, releasing very heavily there. Um, we're able to drop the reservoir to about 20% of capacity um, when just in the past few days or a week or so, um, the warmer temperatures started bringing that one back up, over overtaking our releases. Um, again, kind of a roller coaster there at this point um, with just the warmer temperatures and cooling temperatures um, allowing us to continue to drop it a little bit further. One thing to note in these graphs is you will see there's a lot of releases being made. And, and that really is a realization of the, the substantial volume of water up in the mountains and trying to make space for that runoff to come through. So you'll see we deviate quite drastically from the five-year trends and certainly from last year, but that is because of the, the massive amount of water we anticipate coming down. So, well, can, sorry, can I add, Riley, because I know we've had a couple of um, projects in the river and one in particular that we've had to really try and hold back on the flow, but... Yeah. I, th I think there might be a little bit of a misconception or understanding that only Weber Basin controls those flows or, or can or has the ability to, but can you just, n not in any detail at all, but just who, who how, what dictates how you do these and is, is there anybody else involved besides Weber Basin yes, on that? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. So yeah, um, when it comes to flood control, um, essentially releasing water heavily in order to make room for anticipated runoff. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers is really who dictates that. They have flood control diagrams and criteria for each of our reservoirs that basically, based on the storage that's in the reservoirs and the forecasted runoff that we're going to get, uh, we're basically told, you know, we need to have the reservoir at this level based on what we expect to come in. So it's really um, dictated by the Army Corps of Engineers. They do follow up and make sure we're kind of following those criteria. Um, we have calls with them on a bi month or a um, two-week basis, I guess. Um, and also the Bureau of Reclamation, who owns most of our facilities, 
Um, they're also kind of tracking the flood control um, criteria from the Army Corps and coordinating with us on all that. So, yeah, it's basically us doing most of the operations with a lot of coordination with the Bureau of Reclamation and the Army Corps of Engineers kind of dictating what needs to happen. So. Riley, you may get to this later in your presentation, so I apologize if I'm skipping Don't ahead, but how do you determine how much water is up there that you think is going to fill in the reservoirs. I mean, it's kind of hard to, to gauge how much is going to go in the ground and how much is going to run off. And yeah. I know we have snow tell signs and sites and stuff, but what's kind of the, the method to figure that out? Because it, it seems like the balance is trying to say, okay, let's get this as full as we can without going over the overflow so we can control the water. Right? Exactly. It's a very fine line that we're trying to, to walk there. Um, and luckily, there's a lot smarter people than me that actually try to, um, are the ones forecasting what's going to come down. It's the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center. Um, they've got forecasters, hydrologists that basically look at all the different variables that come into the runoff, um, including you know snowpack, obviously, soil moisture going into the fall, because um, once you start warming up, you know that'll dictate how much of the the snowpack is just going to run right into the ground, and we're never going to see it in the reservoirs. Um, so yeah, they're looking at those two things. Um, they're trying to predict what the weather is going to be in the spring, uh, how it's going to come down. Um, so they're, they're taking all those things into account um, and then giving us basically their best guess or educated guess on um, how much we're actually going to get into each of the reservoirs. So and then um, the, NRCL, the NRCS also does the same type of thing. They put out um, runoff forecasts as well. So we look at both the CBRFC and the NRCS forecast, compare them, and usually they're um, in very close correlation with each other. So that's just kind of a double check we do to make sure we can have good comfort level on what they're telling us. So. So I'm assuming you've projected then like your target level where you need the reservoir to be before those releases from the mountain start really flowing. Yeah, and that's where those um, Army Corps of Engineer flood control diagrams come in. And at this point, most of the reservoirs, those diagrams are telling us we need the reservoirs empty. <laughs> so obviously we're not going to get there. Um, but just with the immense snowpack we have this year, the record snowpack, um, yeah, essentially they're wanting us to have the reservoirs empty in order to absorb as much of that snowpack peak, uh, runoff peak, as we can um, without, you know, while we have controlled releases before it goes into the spillway and we lose control. So. so the Ogden River, I just saw pictures of it. I mean, it's like running at the brink. Yes. Um, okay. Is that because of what you're letting out or is yes. it getting, it is, huh? Yep. Yeah, we're basically, so um, the Army Corps of Engineers and, um, um, I don't know who else would be involved. Um, they have what they call um, safe channel capacities for all the streams um, and res or streams and rivers that we release into. Um, so right now at Pine View or on the Ogden River, we're basically releasing that safe channel capacity. Um, basically, what they tell us we can do um, without, you know, while we're still um, doing controlled releases. Um, obviously, once we start spilling and lose control, obviously that safe channel capacity. Um, it kind of goes out the window, and it's all in Mother Nature's hands at that point. So. May I ask a question along the same lines? Yeah, for sure. So, let's just look at nature, and let's say, for instance, we have a perfect runoff where nature takes care of itself, and we have cool, warm, cool, warm, and it just kind of seeps into the soil, and then we don't fill up the reservoirs. What's the likelihood? Because, um, I mean, I was around during the last flooding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so was a few others in here. Yeah. But it's, you know, that's something that I just, you know, with all the prayers to get water, mm -hmm. yep. and the prayers to now control the water release, mm -hmm. is, I mean, we might be blessed and we might not. Yeah. So if that happens and you've got the reservoirs empty, <laughs> yeah. Then what happens? Yeah, that'd be a bad day for sure. Obviously, um, so it's. I would say it's very unlikely, and I don't know, John. You have any other thoughts on that? No, but I, I would agree, and I think you know these these forecasting tools that Riley's making reference to. These these are being referred to daily, and, and modifications are being made of the projected forecast based on exactly what you said. How is how is the weather pattern playing out? Are we continue to see accumulations of snowpack in those upper elevations? Are we warming up drastically? What are the trends showing? And these forecasts that say 300,000 acre feet of water might jump to 280 or they might jump to 320, but they fluctuate. He'll show you some of these, these forecasted runoffs and what they've done over the course of this year. But uh, this isn't a, we look at it once a week or once a month and make adjustments. This is daily 
couple and times. And multiple times during the day that we're looking at these forecasts, we're looking at how the runoff's coming down, we're looking at the soil moistures and what they're doing to gauge the runoff efficiency and see, you know, is this going to be, you know, infiltrated in the groundwater system or are we going to see it efficiently coming down into the creeks and, and subsequently being gathered in the reservoirs. And so this is, you know, Riley shortchanged himself, but uh, we use all those tools and resources, but we've also been doing this for 70 years, right? And then Riley's not 70 years old, obviously, but he's, he's got all of the information that's been garnered from other staff that have been around for a lot longer than him, and, and records and data that we've gathered to really make sure we're honing in on what happens here. But it is a daily, multiple time day assessment that takes place and will take place over the next, you know, it has since January, and it will continue through, you know, June, July, as long as this runoff goes. All right, uh, so quickly just moving over to the Weber River side of things. Here we can see Rockport and Echo again. Um, Rockport, we started um, releasing water um, in pretty early February, um, just as we started to see that snowpack build, and uh, Rockport was still quite high. Obviously, we were above the five-year average there, so we started uh, releasing just to kind of start anticipating that runoff and to generate power with. Um, and ECHO, um, as Commissioner Anderson mentioned, we did have a uh, um, contractor working in the river um, that we were dealing with. We were trying to hold back releases as long as we could, um, but working with the Army Corps of Engineers, they were um, pretty insistent that we needed to start upping those releases, um, especially starting on, on April 1st. So, and, and Riley, I apologize. There was another graph I saw a while back that, that actually showed how far behind we were. Yeah. Do you have that? I Are do, you going to yeah. show that tonight? Yep, it's Great. a little later Thank on you. in the presentation, but Thank we'll you. get there. Yeah. Um, so, scary. so then looking at Lost Creek and East Canyon. Um, Lost Creek um, is kind of the better looking reservoirs right now as far as flood control goes, and it was just within the past few weeks where we were starting to have to make releases there um, based on those forecasts. Um, you know, initially, earlier on in the winter, we weren't thinking we were going to have to make any flood control releases there, but um, with March, the, um, the huge amount of precipitation and snowpack we accumulated in March, those forecasts for runoff just shot up, skyrocketed, um, and kind of forced us to start making releases there as well. Um, East Canyon, we've been releasing hard um, from um, since about mid-March as well, or late March, um, as you guys are aware. Um, we are, we have been at about safe channel capacity there, um, and actually working with the county, um, um, Austin Turner. We've been working with him pretty closely, and we've actually crept up above that 250 CFS a little bit just to try to get as much water out of East Canyon as we can before Hard Scrabble Creek really starts flowing. Um, so the, potentially we can cut back from East Canyon a little bit at that time. Um, here's Smith and Morehouse. This is a very small reservoir. Um, doesn't really serve any flood control purpose, um, so um, it's not going to do much in terms of slowing down um, the, the runoff up there, that far um, reach of the, the watershed. Um, but we have started dumping it, um, especially today. We, we increased the releases there quite significantly to try to get it down as low as we can. Um, Willard Bay. So Willard Bay is at the kind of bottom of the, the watershed there. It's off stream. That's where we've been trying to collect all the water that we've been releasing. It's kind of our catch-all. Um, we've got the Willard Canal that comes off of the, uh, the Weber River um, in Slaterville. Um, that canal has a capacity of about 1,000 CFS, so we're taking about 1,000 CFS out to Willard Bay um, consistently. Um, so that's why that's been climbing so, so well. Um, the capacity there is about 222,000 acre feet overall, and we do anticipate filling it within the next few weeks. Um, and once we hit that point, um, we have the ability to release 1,000 CFS out the outlet works, the other end of the reservoir. So basically, we'll just be routing 1,000 CFS from the river through Willard Bay and out to the Great Salt Lake just to try to alleviate flooding on the west end of the Weber River. Um, now, just a quick look at snowpack to kind of show you why we're um, seeing the, the runoff forecast we are, obviously most of you have probably seen um, this graph several times this year. Um, they're kind of towards the middle of that uh, colorful area. Um, you can see the median, it's that light green line, that's where we typically see the snow water equivalent on a normal year. Um, the black line there is 2023 this year. Um, you can see we're well above any of the historical um, trends there, um, we're in record territory. Um, we actually peaked out at about 193% of where we typically hit the peak. So 
Um, that is very historic um, snowpack for us and why these runoff forecasts are so high. Um, and then I have also shown there 1984, um, 1983, and 2011, because those are some similar snowpack type years, um, just to kind of show you where we're at in comparison with all, with all of those in the Weber and Ogden drainages. Um, so we're, we're definitely above where we've been in any of those kind of high years there. Um, and then on the left there in that box, you can see as of today, we're about 227% of the median snowpack and about 181% of the median peak. Um, so these are these runoff forecasts um, I was telling you about. These were these are from the CBRFC, the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center. Um, there on the far left, you can see each of our kind of forecast areas, which are um, kind of our main reservoirs, flood control reservoirs. Um, that next column, second from the left, is typically what we see on a normal year um, come into the reservoirs. Um, that next column over is the current forecast, and then the far right column is the percent of the average um, that that current forecast is. So you can see Rockport Echo, um, the forecast is for about 200% of the typical runoff. East Canyon, 325%. That's the highest one we've got, which is why we've been trying to release uh, water so, so heavily from it. Um, Lost Creek, we're at 246%. Pine View, 280. Um, and for a total of overall, 241% of average um, runoff forecast. So definitely got a lot of water that we're trying to get down as safely and um, controlled as possible. Um, so we're doing our best there. Yeah, so Echo Rockport has a combined storage capacity of about 130,000 acre feet. And you can see the forecast is three or, uh, 303. Yeah, 303. Yeah. So that's you know essentially filling and emptying. Twice. And Pine is 110,000 acre feet. So you can see between this graph and that previous one, you know, we, we typically have about 20 inches that we get in the snowpack and we see the 20. 20. So it's a massive amount. What's what's Lost Creek? Lost Creek has a capacity about twenty thousand. Yep. <clears throat> yep. So a lot of water to come down. <laughs> um, and so these are just some of the current releases that we're making for flood control. Um, Causey, um, we're basically maxed out at our um, power plant there. Um, we're putting out about one hundred thirty-five cfs. Um, if you look at the river gauge there on the south fork of the Ogden River, though, um, you'll see about 510 CFS. Um, that's from other tributaries, site tributaries that are uncontrolled and just kind of the low level and mid level snowpack that uh, is below the reservoir there. Uh, Pine View, we're releasing about 1,305 CFS. Um, on the gauge there below Pine View Dam, though, you'll see 1,500 CFS in the river, and that's due to Wheeler Creek, which is um, an, an uncontrolled tributary there. Um, Rockport, we're releasing about 615 CFS. Echo, we're at about 1130. Lost Creek, 155. And East Canyon, 250. Between 250 and 300. So, so one CFS is about two acre feet a day. <coughs> right. Any any plans of having any more putting any more reservoirs in? Um, <laughs> not that I'm aware of. <laughs> we don't build them anymore. We just take them down. <laughs> two feet, that's about 20,000 acre feet of storage, and in that process we already had the water right secured for the storage of that additional 20,000 acre feet of water, and it was probably a 15 year process. And that's just expanding. And that's, that's where you have water rights secured. If you look at you know, policy that's being driven by the state right now, um, I don't think there's any development project that comes through without mitigation measures to offset depletion. That's done by the state? Correct. State engineer. All right, so I believe these are the graphs that uh, Commissioner Anderson was referring to. Um, so these are just going to be a quick comparison um, of basically what our runoff forecast is compared to some other big years, um, specifically 2011 in blue and 2017 in orange. Um, again, black is where we are this year. Um, so these first couple we'll look at are Pine View. Um, so this is the forecast again, kind of what we're getting from the CBRFC. You can see there um, we are well above at this point um, where we were in 2011 and 2017 as far as how much water we're expecting to get into Pine View Reservoir. Um, so looking at storage, um, again 2017 and 2011 there shown um, versus our black line this year. 
Um, you can see we're well below where we have been um, in those two big years, and um, it's been a long time since Pine has been this low, in fact. Um, so um, that's just an, in anticipation of um, receiving all that runoff and trying to route through as much of it as possible without, you know, losing control and spilling over the spillway. So um, those are going to be all vertical lines here shortly, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yep, as soon as we get some warm temperatures and that runoff really starts coming in, it's going to be crazy. Um, so this is a look at a comparison of the releases um, over those few years. Um, you can see in 2017, the orange line, we were making pretty heavy releases early, and I, I think that was in anticipation of um, the Weber River um, peaking er or later in the season, so we were trying to get as much water out of the Ogden side um, early, and then we could worry about the Weber side later um, so that we didn't have that peak hitting all at once out of Plain City, kind of the west end of the Weber River. Um, and then on the, in 2011, it was kind of the opposite. We were getting rid of water out of the um, uh, yeah, 2011, we were um, releasing pretty heavily from Pine View um, during the later part of the, the spring runoff time. Um, as I mentioned, 1600 CFS is about kind of our safe channel capacity right below the dam. Um, so right now we're about 1300 CFS, um, with Wheeler Creek about 1500 CFS. Um, you can see back in these two years, we got up to 1,700 and 1,800 CFS, and that's due to um, releases through the power plant um, further down the canyon as well. So they didn't necessarily add into the, the um, flow in the river directly downstream of the dam. So that's how we were able to get above that 1,600 CFS. Um, The battery dying. Yeah. So next we'll look at Echo. So again, this is the uh, comparison of our forecasted runoff. Um, you can see we're just below where we were antis or where the forecast was this time of year in 2011, and we're well above where we were in 2017 this time. Then. Storage in Echo, um, again, well below, below where we were in 2017, slightly below where we were in 2011. Um, again, you can see here, you know, April 1st, um, about when we were basically being told by the Army Corps of Engineers we need to increase those releases uh, pretty heavily, so um, that's when we started uh, really dropping it. Um, you can see at that point we were um, above where we were in 2011 with a similar forecast and the Army Corps was getting very nervous uh, about that. Um, and the trend or the, the slope of that line was just not looking where they wanted to see it. So that's really why they, they wanted us to start dropping that reservoir so hard. Riley, how does the the anticipated runoff this year compare to 2011? Uh, if you'll go back one slide. Yeah, so um, 2011, we're just below um, where we were. So, and these forecast graphs are kind of probably a little confusing to look at. So, these lines are showing basically what the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center is anticipating to run off throughout the whole season, the runoff season, from April through July. And so, whether the forecast we're looking at here was on, you know, uh, January 22nd, it's still kind of forecasting that entire range of runoff, or I guess April, sorry, April, so that entire range of runoff, and kind of same towards the end. Um, you know, even the forecast that comes out in June, it's basically telling us how much runoff we're going to get from April through July. And so, um, yeah, obviously, by the time you get to the end of the season, numbers are a little more concrete. We've already seen a lot of that runoff come in. Um, and in 2011, um, we were getting a lot of late season snowpack accumulation. So um, April and May, we were still getting snow up in the high elevations. So that forecast just kept coming up. Um, so, but snowpack wise, I mean, what's what's up there this year compared to what was there this time of year in 2011? Um, so that was a graph we showed several slides ago. Sorry, that one. Okay. Yep. So you can see um, right now, right there. We peaked out in 2011 right there, um, so we're right now we're still well above where we were at that point. So, okay. um, yeah, like John mentioned, I think we've got 40 inches of snow water equivalent, whereas the the typical where we typically hit the peak is about 21. So, oh. yeah, a lot of water. Yeah, what's scary right now is those steep declines. 
in the spring season. If we get a, you know, if you look at the median, it's a pretty tapered decline, which allows you to have that controlled runoff. Yeah. And you get that 1983 where you continue to add to the snowpack well into the, the spring season, then you get those temperatures that just shift drastically. You don't have two months to make room for it. It's coming down in a couple, you know, two, three weeks. So we hope that we already hit our peak is what you're saying. Yeah. We don't know if we did though yet because yeah. it could go back up. Yeah. It's a possibility. It's another thing to see on these graphs right here is just the spread, right? If you were starting to plan for a runoff in January, I mean, you were planning this year for 140,000 acre feet. And then you can see every week it's gone up and down a little bit and up. And so it's, you got to look at these things all the time. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so this is just a comparison of the um, releases, um, 2011, 2017, and this year. Um, you can see 2011, we were making some pretty high releases right now at this point, um, but we're well above where we were in 2017. Um, you can see in um, 2011, we even got to you know just over 2,000 CFS um, in early June, probably. Um, so we're hoping by making some of these larger releases right now that we'll avoid getting up that high. But um, again, just all going to depend on how the, the spring temperatures happen and how it all comes down. So. And then this is my last slide. This is just a quick look at the, the temperature and precipitation outlook. Um, this is actually for April, so we're halfway through this already. Um, but this, you know, obviously we, like some of you mentioned, we want to see um, kind of a warm up, a cool down, warm up, cool down, just so we can bring it down a little more slowly, not all at once, like John mentioned. Um, and this is kind of what we're seeing so far in the past few weeks. We have seen a warm up, cool down, another warm up and cool down. So that's what we want to see um, for for the rest of April. Um, the National Weather Service, uh, NOAA, is anticipating that we're going to see below normal temperatures um, and drier than normal precip. So um, it's definitely good for what we're trying to do. And Hopefully, these come to fruition. Sketchy predictions at best. Yeah, that's true. Don't put too much stock in them. <laughs> I'll believe Blaine's woolly worms more than that. <laughs> they were right this year. They were right. 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 Yeah, they were right. emailing us. Yeah, yeah, he better, better. <laughs> tell you. Well, this one was found in January. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any questions for John and Riley? We sure appreciate you taking the time to come up and visit with us and appreciate the work you're doing to try to mitigate flooding as best we can and we'll hope for hope and pray for the best. Yeah, yeah no problem. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity and we'll keep working closely with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May, may I ask one more question? Yes. Okay. Right now East Canyon is within that far going over in a majority of places. If that happens, are you going to stop the flow up there? Because, I mean, at least from there until hard scrub, because hard scrub hasn't kicked in since we had the cool now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. so I'm just wondering, okay, if all of a sudden hard scrub starts coming down, East Canyon is letting it out, mm -hmm. can you stop that so that hard scrub can... Because um, so, we're going to have some homes destroyed. Yeah, we can definitely, and like I mentioned, I've been working with Austin Turner, um, Pretty heavily, um, you know. I've been talking with him at least every other day the past couple of weeks, and we have been making adjustments based on those conversations. He's been telling me, you know, when hard scrabble is flowing on the really warm days, um, he'll give me a call, ask me to dial it back a little bit at East Canyon, and yeah, we've been working a little bit that way together. Um, I think um, we got it down to, you know, like I said, we're about 250 CFS between 250 and 300 right now. Um, that. I think it was last week, end of last week, when we were having the warmer temperatures, uh, we dialed it back to 190 because um, hard scrabble was flowing pretty good and there were some other tributaries and just low level snow melt that was um, just causing a lot of issues for you guys. So, yeah, we're definitely willing to work with you. It's going to be, it'd be very hard to shut it off completely with the Army Corps of Engineers, what they're telling us to do. Um, but yeah, we can definitely work with you as best as we can. We're going to dance that line yeah. all year. <laughs> So okay. we'll see how you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. So Thank you. I, I actually <laughs> hope you're wrong. Maybe our, maybe our second meeting in July, we ought to have a report. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, we'll move to our action items. Miss Blackett and Miss Gale.
Hi, we are the cheerleaders from Morgan High School. The cheerleaders will be providing a service to the county by putting up flags for all these holidays. Memorial Day, Flag Day, Independence Day, Pioneer Day, Labor Day, 9-11, and Veterans Day. The cost is $30 for one flag for all of these holidays. In the past, the county has purchased 12 flags. Is this something the county would like to do again, and if so, how many flags? I think that's a great thing yep. to do. We've been doing that's this for a long time. That's actually a great presentation. That's a great presentation, too. <laughs> so thank you. You're welcome. I'm definitely in favor of doing it. Do you, thank you. Do you All right, guys, Mr. Chair, is 12, I'll make a motion oh, that sorry, I got 12 it. flags. I, I agree, <laughs> but do you guys need more than 12 flags? Why 12? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know either. Okay. That was the even number they came up with at one point. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to make a motion for more, go for it. I just think it's a great service that you guys provide, not just for the county, yeah. throughout you. the county. Phenomenal you, service. It's great. Sorry, Commissioner McConnell. <laughs> well, no, I put you do you want me to increase the oh, number I just, of flags? I, I don't know. Just curious, but. I'll, I'll, my motion was 12 flags. I'll stick with it. Second. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. We appreciate Thank it. You. All right. Item number two, Julie. Um, so I just gave you guys some, some examples of what we could purchase if you would like, but there is I don't have a budget for an HR, so this would have to come from somewhere else. Um, and I've just noticed that we get a lot of pamphlets given to us at the table that are getting covered with them. And so my suggestion is that we either buy a display case that would go out in the foyer where it's like bigger and everything is facing forward so people can see the slots and see the items. Or we just get a small one to put right here so that we can stack them in there. Um, but it's just a, an idea, you know, whatever you guys would like to do. It's just, I'm getting a lot of these, but they bring them to my room a lot, they bring them to the front office, and nobody has space to put anything like that. So we fill up the bulletin boards, and just wanted to know if you'd like to provide that service for the community. I'd like to make a suggestion, before we purchase it, that you look at public surplus and see if any other counties are getting rid of some. That would save a cost. Do we have anything? We, we may even have something at the library. Yeah, yeah we might. Let me check with them. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Doesn't seem like a bad idea to have a location to put that kind of stuff. There is a small one out in the foyer area, but it's a circular one and it's full. I took out anything that was old in it, but nobody has even noticed it because it is this tiny little circular thing that sits in a corner. And nobody pays any attention to it. I'd be interested. I think we just need to find out what the costs are. Okay. I think the idea is a good one in terms well, of. Well, number three was good. not a bad cost, and it looked like a. 130 bucks, is that the one you're looking yeah. at? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like we're talking between 130 and. 200. 30 or something. For the no, most yeah, that's not much. And free shipping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. Um, do we want to make any motion on this then? To what's your thing? I, I, I don't mean to go on a little bit of a tangent here, but <laughs> most departments have um, office and supplies budget, and so if they want to get a new chair, they're obviously not going to come before the commission saying, "Hey, I'm going to get a new chair." So. I, I appreciate you coming for us to say, hey, this is going to be something new that's going to be placed in the hall, but I'm not sure I really am very, very indifferent on the cost or with it being so minimal, doesn't even, I mean, unless you've got to change your budget for it. So. She, yeah, she doesn't have it in her budget. I don't have it. I, I didn't consider it an HR budget item. It's more like community service. So I didn't know where it should come out of. But um, I don't have it in my budget for this year. I can alter that, or we can use funds from somewhere else if there's funds available for something like this. I, I didn't know. I just see the need yeah. from what I've Yeah, building some grounds and maintenance is probably what I would suggest it come from. Yeah. I don't know what we have available, but that would be a no, talk no. with 
<laughs> Brett oversees that department ultimately. Three hundred dollars. We may have it in the council budget. That's the true. Commission we, have a, budget. we have a we have a budget that we don't spend. Spend typically. <laughs> So it looks to me like this one, the fixture displays literature rack. It's $200. $200 looks like it has the greatest capacity. Yeah, that's number three. I guess it's $200. 45 pockets. Whoa. That's amazing. You're right. We have a, we have a supplies budget that we rarely use. We could probably just pay for it out of that and be done with it. I'll make a motion that uh, we give the go-ahead to purchase number three, the $200 display, and take it out of our budget for supplies from the commission budget. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. Okay. And my reasoning, may I just mention a reasoning? is if we purchase this one that and the motion was to purchase this one what about if we find the same kind of a thing at a lesser price through like public sur surplus or from the library or wherever from another entity okay. let's look into it i think we also ought to consider if we have to go very far to get it you're probably going to end up spending almost as much in fuel to right. go get it as you would so, but we could certainly look into it, and if yeah. it's an option, great. But other than that, I'll say me, or I. <laughs> okay. Motion passes. Either way. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Fackrell. Okay. Next item uh, was brought to my attention. Where did my... We have a bunch of these that Jared got. These coins. And uh, my question is, is are they going to continue to sit in the HR office or are we going to do something with them and are we going to have a plan to distribute these as tokens, souvenirs, whatever we want to do. I'm just trying to help out the storage of these coins. That's all. Yeah, I don't know if you guys remember when I brought them to, to us. I think it was eight months ago or so. Mm -hmm. And um, asked the same question, just didn't didn't follow didn't up on it. So I appreciate up. you following up on so it. How many do we have? A couple hundred, I think. Four hundred, I thought. Yeah. And who are you proposing that they be distributed? That's to? what. That's what the discussion is. So okay. when when we had the uh, lieutenant governor and her group come, mm -hmm. she has some commemorative coins, and she gave me one, and I went and got those coins and gave to all of her group. I think it's good to have a few of those on hand for. For that purpose, to share with other public officials, just that's kind of a yeah. I just don't know if we want to go and but we certainly don't need 400 for that. So. Yeah, I mean, I if if we by chance kind of go to any of our events that we go to, you know, a lot of times they'll give out those of their own counties, but yet we have nothing to give to anybody as just a token of our, you know, hey, here's Morgan County. Hey, we are on we are on the map. You know, just as a thought. I'm I mean I'm just or we can give it to the library to have the library. I've, ne I've never you know. been given anything. Oh, I've got a from bunch of anybody. Them. Maybe I'm not as friendly as you are. That's so you got to go to them first. But anyway, uh, <laughs> there's there's no maybe in that. I'm not as friendly. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> we've got a you know. The lieutenant governor, you know, I got one from her. I've got one from Box Elder County, the well, sheriff's I, department. I think we ought to make you our ambassador. I to, am to already head, to the coin handout or coin coinman. So uh, I I don't really care. I just don't want to go and say, hey, I'd like ten of them to take with me to the trails conference and you know give it to somebody or something we, like that. Didn't we talk about giving them to all of our employees too? Did we do we that? Did. Yeah. Uh, we Did didn't they, do that, but we, but we haven't done that. it yet. I think we ought to do that initially. Mm -hmm. So do I have a suggestion, Chair and Commissioner Fackrell, because you put this on the agenda. I really think in a quick email chain, and maybe this is suggestions come from you, Commissioner Fackrell, saying, hey, here's my ideas. 
we can massage them a little bit and then just come to an agreement. And well, I certainly am not opposed to any members of the commission taking them to these events and, and handing them out. I mean, that yeah, we've got to get, great. we should distribute them one way or another. And if we want to do distribute them to employees to reduce the number of boxes right now, that would be a good thing. Maybe we set some out on a table. When they're picking up a brochure, if somebody wants one of our coins, they can have one of those too. And maybe us non so friendly commissioners need to put hand out more. It'll That's break right. us out of our shell. Sounds good. <laughs> that guy can use this as a projector. Okay. Sounds good. All right, so are we going to give them to the employees first? We need to make sure if that's the case, we give one to every employee Agreed. first, and then we can start. I like the idea of doing that. Just I agree. Say. Okay. And who's going to do that? I think we already made that decision. Our coins are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we need to just send it out to all of Morgan employees and everything within the county that says if you want a coin, come see the HR. Full-time full -time okay. employees. Can you send that out, please? Thank full. You. Full-time employee Full time. Fine. You could put it next to your treats. Sure. Yeah, that's an idea too. There's probably a couple of people in this room that have put in enough hours in this this room. They probably ought to get things on one if they want one. That's too. right. That's right. Planning commission and all. I think the idea of the challenge going is supposed to go hand in hand. Supposed yeah. To go from one of you to the hand of the person. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's a challenge coin. Yeah. We, we talked about at one point doing kind of a summer activity for our employees. No, like no a, slingshots, Commissioner. <laughs> well, so maybe, we, maybe we do it then and hand them out then. We could do that. I think that's a good idea, too. I'm okay with whatever you want. I just know if you want me to be the ambassador for Morgan County, I will take some with me to my different events and hand some out. I think you kind of are already. So. I am. Well, I think all of us ought to take a few to some of those, those things sure. and hand them out. If we sure. Yep. Wrong with that. <laughs> so. Cool. What, what kind of uniform comes with being the ambassador? <laughs> I don't know. Just a jacket. And a... Okay. I wish I could just wear my coveralls. It doesn't right. work. You can wear your coveralls. <laughs> you can wear whatever you want. People might remember One of the more. days I might just wear them here. <laughs> you have a time or two. Maybe not to the commission meeting, though. Oh, shucks. All right. Commissioner Wilson. Ladder truck. Ladder truck's already been approved. We just, we're just we going to ratify that so we can make the payment to them. They can pick that up. So I attached the... Invoice. invoice with that okay I have a question with that mm -hmm. I was approached um, what fund is that going to come out of the, the we said the general fund non departmental because they um, needed and all that no we'll have to we'll have to transfer the money I would say we transfer it to the fire department and take it out of one of their accounts okay or, or From fleet, the, probably fleet huh from the general Move fund. It into the fleet budget and then pay for it out of there. But that'll have to be a budget amendment that we do. Okay. With so, Leslie. so we'll have to let Leslie know, make sure of that for our next budget like resolution. GL numbers, not just in general. Yeah. If you guys have GL numbers for it. I'll just go what see we here. We need is a cheat, cheat sheet of GL numbers oh, and then I'll we could call that out <laughs> in every meeting. Okay. Or as part of our requirements to have on the agenda. Yeah, that too. So do we still need a form of motion to ratify? Yes, I we do. We do. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we ratify the purchase of a 2002 Pierce Dash 75 foot ladder truck from Syracuse City in the amount of $100,000 with the funds to come from the fund balance. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. Okay, Garrett. Oh, all right. And this is also with uh, Kyle Hooker, who's here. Do you want to come on up? Hey, Kyle. So this is um, ratification, or no, this is a, a renewal 
of a property lease agreement for some property at the Morgan County Fairgrounds. And I think Kyle could give some of the history, but I think one of the, the great things about barefoot tubing is they were looking for a way to get some of the taxes to come back to the county because most tubers start in Summit County and they take the taxes where the uh, adventure starts, so to speak. And so Kyle's made a lot of efforts to bring the starting to our county so that the county can collect taxes and then he takes them up and then they end in the county. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. And um, would you say that this started in 2014? Started right before the big water of 2011. I know that year well because <clears throat> we didn't get started till the 17th of July that year. So these guys talking about the water coming down is uh, very interesting. Uh, so, um, but uh, barefoot tubing, we're just basically you know here to redo the lease again. Um, this is my third time coming before you gentlemen, and it changes every five years. But. Uh, uh, really not a whole lot of change other than upping the rent a little bit and trying to get a little more parking where we are so we don't have people on the street. We don't like people parking on the street. That's not, we don't, we don't like that. So, so the, the agreement that I emailed around is one that I had um, kind of redlined um, because I can't find a digital copy of this agreement. I did copy it over into a Word document, but it messed up all the formatting and I have not completed that. And so I think if you look at it, some of the main things that would be updated on page one is just updating the dates. And so it would be executed today. Um, the term would be from July 1st, 2023 to the last day of June, 2028. So just kind of updating the dates. It also, acknowledges that that 100 by 200 feet that's been used for parking would be extended to 150 and by 250 feet which just gives that parking and allows for um, more safety and also on the first page it would increase the the annual rent by thousand dollars so um in on page two paragraph five it talks about improvements as shown on exhibit b the exhibit b that i attached here was just my own approximation of what that extension of the parking lot would be and um i i did not get with kyle to provide me an updated exhibit but i think we could we could do that just acknowledging that extension if it's granted tonight um, for the for the final signature. Uh, maintenance of the premises under paragraph six. I did have a note here that I wanted Kyle to discuss the water lines because it, it's my understanding that uh, our public works put in some water lines and, um, and didn't replant the grass that he had planted. And so I think there was just some questions and clarification there. That's not a big deal. Okay, okay. The main reason is because we're going to not be able to get started until the middle of July this year. It's going to be a, a very sparse year. Just like two years ago was a sparse year because we had to close early. Because remember, the water got shut off early. So uh, Park City Rafting, actually all the rafting companies were done by July 31st. Um, and it just got all shut down. But so... Uh, I think that grass is probably going to grow back because we're not going to be driving on it in June or early July this year. So I usually spread some seed around and try to get it to grow so it's, it's nice and pretty. Right. So are you, what are you changing? Are you starting at, at that point and then driving them up there and dropping yeah, so them we off? Start, so here's the deal. Is there's, there's really very little parking up at the top, and there's a lot of people that are going up, up at the top that are private tubers. Um, and so... Uh, years ago, we decided, well, first of all, I own Park City Rafting also, which is at Taggart's. So um, all of, both of the rafting, I mean, I've been in recreation for 38 years. So uh, doing rafting and snowmobiling and tubing. 
tubing's really grown. You probably noticed that. Part of it is us, and part of it is just private people that go on their own. Um, but um, we started we started our building, check them in, and then we drive them up, do a little five minute orientation, so they know how to operate these high technical high piece uh, equipment, you know, the tube. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and then we pick them up at Taggart and we bring them back down to the building because there's very little parking at Taggart. I'm sure you've been there on a weekend or you've tried to drive by or seen it from the freeway. It's, it's pretty, pretty bad. But so we really don't have any impact on the parking. We just pick up and drop off and that's where, you know, having the, where we are is good. It's also good because people that are going tubing with us, they're also gassing up and buying stuff at the stores and all that stuff. So. I kind of like to keep things local if we can. Summit County has enough stuff going on. Yeah, they do. And I work there in the wintertime, so, yeah. <laughs> Questions? Yes, I have a few. <clears throat> I always have questions, guys. Okay, approximately how many people do you have come through your company at our location? For barefoot tubing, Usually, it's between ten and 12,000 people a summer, but two years ago, it was a lot less than that. Our, we, our, our season is usually about 12, 12 weeks, basically the middle of June till the first weekend in September, but when we have a year like this one, or two years ago when they shut the water off, we ended up getting seven weeks out of a 12-week season. So it's just too dangerous right now. Way too, yeah, way too high, way too fast, way too cold. So we will not run the river. I mean, we don't let people go if they're under 12, if they're like, you know, really out of shape, or if they're like really old or frail. I mean, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get people in a box that's safe. And that being said, we can't control everybody, but we, I mean, I've told people it's fine, you just can't go. And I can say that because I've been doing this stuff all my life, and sometimes I'm a pretty good judge of that sort of thing. But, um, so we really don't have a lot of injuries and accidents and stuff like that. Our tubes are pretty darn durable. You won't ever see one of our tubes on the side of the river because they cost over 100 bucks each. And I think I had one that deflated last year out of like 10,000 people who went down the river with us. So. We don't get any garbage. You don't get the tube. In fact, we clean up the garbage. We send rafts down on Monday mornings and pick up all the Walmart crappy tubes that go down. So. so your Park City rafting. Yes. Is that yours also? I started Park City rafting in 1996. Okay. So your Park City rafting, they start over there in Park City? No. It's called Park City rafting because people didn't know there was any rafting back in 1996. Okay. So we called it that. It starts at Taggart, and that's where our building is. And then we, uh, so we check them in there, and then we drive them up, put them on the river with the guides and the equipment, come back down, get off at Taggart, walk back over to the building. And the building's over towards our building the is uh, just restaurant, two hundred yards past the restaurant. Okay, east of it then. What? East of it? Uh, I don't know, east or west. Well, it can't be west. So. Thank you. Okay. I just know it's up the road because there's not much of a road there. It's like the restaurant, a couple houses. Okay. Then, All right. And then Jack's property. All right. All right. Um, and then my question on all of this is um, the movability of your whole operation. If we had to move it to the other side of the river or whatever we might have to do, Mm -hmm. If there's some kind of a project that we're working on that we need to go through there, what, how will that affect your that's operation? A, that's a great question. Um, five years ago, when, we, when I came and we signed the lease, we were actually going to move us across the street to where the pickleball courts are because we were talking about putting in a, uh, a campground where we are now. And so we did that. But then every year I was like, well... We're not going to do it yet, not going to do it yet. So we stayed where we were, and then they built pickleball courts. And I was like, oh, wow, I guess we're not moving across the street. And uh, which is fine, because I've, I've got a container, and I've got a little building. It is, it is movable. I mean, I could pay somebody to put it on a flatbed and move it. So okay. we're not married to the location, if that's what you're asking. We okay. could move it. I don't know how hard it would be, but we could move it. 
is there any way that you could maybe paint your container and make it look, say, barefoot tubing or something like that? So, I try. <laughs> Here's the thing. I I'm just trying to, to make it look good for our tourism. Right, that right, we're right. trying to we're trying to bring here, which would affect it will help you. So, so people aren't going to accidentally drive by barefoot tubing and say, "Oh, let's go tubing." It's just people make reservations online. They know about us from you know word of mouth and from going before, and or they've come down the river on their own and their Walmart crappers popped and then they saw us floating by. And, you know, uh, I try to keep it as low profile as possible because we're closed for nine and a half months out of the year and I, I've had people break into the building and try to rip the container doors off. And if I can keep people from not seeing it, then I have less problems with people vandalizing and stuff. I don't put big signs up. I mean, I can. Yeah, I, I know. Open. I'm just I'm just trying to make it to where it's a pleasant place for those tourists that come from out of town to come and, you know, okay, we've got destination sports, but what about barefoot tubing? I mean, that's part of the plan yeah. is to utilize all these companies within Morgan County yeah, and, bring and, tourism, and yeah. to bring tourism here. Yeah. I mean, somebody may not want to go on a raft, but they do want to go on a tube. Yeah. So that's all I'm saying is, is beautify it. Yeah. Well, when the grass is growing, it's actually quite pretty there. So and, when, uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Last year, it was a bunch of dirt. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. All right. And so, um, as far as in Park City rafting, you don't have any location over in Summit County? Yet. Nope. Okay. Nope. Right. I just work there in the wintertime, but that has nothing to do with this. So I watch all that water accumulate up there at Deer Valley where I work. <laughs> well, my Ready concern was just the price, is all, other than those ones I've already mentioned. Um, my only question or thought was most of our lease agreements for other property have a an automatic increase clause. It's a small percentage typically, but 3 to 4 percent. It just says it goes up by 3 percent every year. We've done that with our airport leases, our cell tower leases, etc. I don't know if that's something we'd like to do here, but it may be something to consider. Granted, it's going up this this if time. You, like if, five if, if you'd rather, if you'd rather take the three thousand that we've paid the last five years and take it up five or six percent, I'd be all in favor of that. <laughs> but on a calculator, I can tell that's less than uh, twenty-five percent. This is a short-term lease. Yeah, yeah this is a short-term lease, reason. and so maybe it's not that big a deal because we do an increase. I mean, yes, we're increasing it this time, but I think the increase is because we're increasing the space. Yeah. Not just simply. I really want to keep people the off the road. So I want to be able to get them in our area and not have them just to keep there. them off of the road. Yeah. yeah. But so I'm okay with the rate as it is. I just was throwing that out there in case that yeah. was something. This is this is kind of side to that. Usually, so when we first started, we didn't know how successful it would be, and so we had we paid a thousand dollars on July first and a thousand dollars on December first, and then the second time it came around, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to pay it once because I don't want to have to worry about paying something in December when I'm busy snowmobiling, and. Uh, but now it's up to four thousand dollars, and I am not going to be making any money till the middle of July. Can we just do a one-time thing where I can play like August first, just this year? I mean, I don't have an issue. I don't have that. Don't I mean, we don't need to change anything. I would just pay when I start making some money, because otherwise, I, you know, it's going to be a tough year this year because it's not going to be. How much do you think you um, contribute to the sales tax? when you do your sales tax every year? That is a darn good question, and I really don't know. My wife is a tax your accountant, and she all does that. all that stuff. Okay. I mean, I can. I mean, I, I, I know about what we gross. Well, there's certainly more revenue in sales tax I'm, than nothing. Well, no, I'm, so what I'm trying to do to is, people. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm got just kind of curious if you're willing to, at a later point, is talk with our tourism uh, group, yeah. our tourism board, and then let's try to get something, you know, working to where, you know, we help. We help you and your yeah. business, and I, we help I've been to one or two meetings. Because it brings more to us every time yeah. you rent something to somebody. Yeah. Like I say, I've been, in Summit, I've, I've been in Summit County for 35 years, and they get, they get plenty of tourism money. Yeah, I know. So... I know, right. and we want to get some of that. That's yeah. why I, I'm um, making sure that you're domiciled yeah. here. Our problem here is the only thing we really have is the river. 
Yeah, I don't. I mean, everything else is private property. And when I come to meetings and talk with people, it's like all we have is the river, and most of that's private too. So it's kind so, of getting tricky with you know where you can. Okay, operate. I'll talk to you later on all this. Cool, I appreciate I can, that. If I can, um, just send me your your contact information unless you've got it. I've got it. Mr. Smith has that. He's All right. Are you He's ready for a motion? So on, on page two, would you like me to insert at the top of the page um, where it says, or before July 1st, except in 2023 by August 1st? And then... Thanks. That'll make my life easier. And then that... That kind of goes to the, the what I crossed out toward the bottom of page three, where it says semi-annual installment. <coughs> I just made that annual because of the update. I think last time where it yeah, said I, it would just come once I, a year. I, I, I just like to pay things off and be done with it. Okay, and then okay. Uh, I know when we had met to go over the the contract <coughs> on page three, it has. Paragraph 14, assignment and subordination, that, you know, the lessee doesn't have the right to sell a signed sublease mortgage. And we kind of got talking about, um, like, a successor or a sign, but it does have a provision um, on page 518 that allows for successors and assigns. And so we don't need to add another provision, which I had indicated on page 6. So, anyway, I was just going to say I'll cross that off and... Other than what we've talked about today, leave everything else the same for the final. Um, do you want to put in the clause the uh, annual, or not annual, but... Where it's a short-term lease, I'm okay with just okay. leaving it the way it is. and We can negotiate that every five years. Okay. That's fine. And then, sorry, one more on page 7, where it, it's got Exhibit A down at number 13. Talks about barefoot tubing LLC will provide four wooden picnic tables and clear and maintain debris and maintain broken grass by June 1st, 2011. And maybe we just update that or, or yeah, I had it. To, is there? We had we had some problems with that access. You know the little access right by the river where the bridge is. That was that's called the barefoot tubing access because we used to do trips. Sometimes you know we'd go from Taggart down to the building, um, right there by the bridge. And we had picnic tables there and garbage cans, but we ended up with some problems because I was a teenager once, so I don't know how it is, but they would come and throw my tables in the river and had had a few problems. I had a tree swing right there and they would, you know, you know how teenagers are. They sometimes get a little rambunctious and so I had some problems. So I got a little frustrated and just stopped putting picnic tables out and stopped mowing the lawn because I was having problems by making it accessible. As it is, people are still using it, which is great, but... Um, Do you want me to strike that then, just before yeah, picnic just strike tables? It. Just yeah, strike that yeah I don't have any picnic tables anymore. I had to throw them away. Okay. The ones I dug out of the stuff out of the river. Yeah. All right. Thanks. I appreciate your time. Thank you. It's fun to see the wheels of government turning. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome anytime. I thought there'd be a fight or something. I thought you guys. We're here every other you know. Tuesday. Come on, in. <laughs> some some weeks there are. <laughs> yeah, motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the Morgan County Fairgrounds property lease agreement with Barefoot Tubing LLC, um, as annotated in our packet by the county attorney, with the further additions and revisions that we've discussed this evening. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, you very Appreciate much. It. Thank All you. Right. And we wish you, you the best this year. I hope you can get in there early and stay late. But Fortunately, everything is paid for, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be going to the courthouse this year. <laughs> Good to <laughs> it should be barefoot white water tubing. Yeah, it might be barefoot white water tubing. <laughs> <laughs> All say, right. Destination Sports is already doing it. They got kayaks going down there. Yeah, I saw people on the river the day before yesterday. All right, um, on to item number six. Um, and Austin and, and Garrett, thank you for getting this together. It was kind of a little bit last minute, so there's an email that you got late in the day here with this 
emergency declaration. Um, essentially, an emergency declaration allows us to access funding. That's really all this does. Um, the declaration itself that we have written does note that it's ongoing for no more than 30 days until terminated or extended pursuant to the law. It will probably go longer than 30 days, is my suspicion, this particular thing. But my thought is we can always extend it in 30 days should we feel inclined to do that. What's wrong with saying 120 days right now? Yeah. So I, and I had talked about that with Austin, maybe going out to July 15th, but as I was reviewing the codes that I'm referencing, you know, in the in the declaration, it does limit it to uh, 30 days. I'm going to pull that up here. That's the state code that limits the, it to the state days. code. So this is under. Yeah. So do we just have to amend it every 30 days until? Yeah. So actually, Mike is the one that declares it. It doesn't have to go to a vote oh. for the initial declaration. Okay. And so it's just the chief executive officer of the county. And so well, you would declare I it. I want to make sure everybody's comfortable with, with declaring this. Well, <laughs> by statute, if a majority of them, you know, of the rest of the commission votes to terminate it, they can do it immediately. Gotcha. And so you do want to have at least majority support, or you could be. I could sign it you and could everybody could say, nope, it's done, and it'll, exactly. be, it'll last two minutes. Yes. I think I think COVID's kind of modified it. So well, and yeah. with COVID, they said that they you can't. What does it say? It says you can't do it for a pandemic. <laughs> so I think they changed that. So they kind of. Yeah. yeah, they said a chief executive officer of a municipality may not declare a, by proclamation a state emergency in response to an epidemic or a pandemic. So they did add that I'm after glad to hear that. 2020. That's in response to Salt Lake right. County and Salt Lake <laughs> right. City is what that is. So. But I think with having Riley here to talk to you guys before, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're going to be in this for a while. So yeah, yeah. do we just bring it every third Tuesday of the month because? again? So well, it sounds like if, no, if actually, I can just I'll declare it, I can just redeclare it until you guys end it, right? No. So, so yeah, sorry. <laughs> this is fun. I don't know. <laughs> I'm glad I read the statute, otherwise I wouldn't know any of these answers. Um, so just for those listening, it's Utah Code 53-2A-208, but if we go down to subsection 6A, it says, um, except as provided in subsection 6B, the state of emergency described in subsection 1 expires the earlier of, and subsection 2 says 30 days after the day on which the chief executive officer declares the state of emergency and there's others um, you know the legislative body terminating um, by majority vote the threat or danger is passed so there there's other other ways it can terminate but for this one where we anticipate it'll go longer under 6b it says um, B subsection 2 it says the legislative body of a municipality or county may by majority vote extend a state of emergency for a time period stated in the motion and so what I would say is let's I mean you know if you so choose you could declare the emergency today which would go until uh, the 18th of May, but we have an, another commission meeting on May 16th, and so 28 days in, the legislative body, you know, we could get a motion, an action item on the agenda where you can make a motion to extend it, and at that point, by majority vote, you could set a time. So it wouldn't be limited to 30 days at that point. So we can't extend it tonight. We have to wait. Um, well, it sounds days. like you could because I mean, I guess so if you, you have to wait till the end. Yeah, right? if you declare uh, it and then make I'd a love motion. To extend it so right I can now. declare it and you can make a motion so, to extend so, it um, now, right? Yeah. It, In theory. Yeah. If we have 30 days, let's see how it goes. Yeah. It, I'm I'm not opposed to coming back every every commission meeting and talking to you guys. And just giving you Maybe we don't want to see you every three I years. don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't looked in the mirror for a couple of weeks now for the same reason, <laughs> Commissioner Anderson. But, um, it, yeah, I think, 
I think everything we've dealt with to this point is low-level flooding that should have been melted off a couple, a month ago. And so the serious runoff and snow melt hasn't even started yet. So that being said, so, is there any so reason going, to wait to declare in, this? Yeah, we're kind no, of. No, I'm saying we declare we now declare because now. we're already we're already wading okay. into it. I guess if you're making okay, that point, destroyed. that kind of backs up. But I think that we make a motion also that it lasts longer than. 30 I don't really days. want, I just, but but I don't really want to put an end date because I don't know what it's going to end. I mean, so this is the highest it, highest snowpack. You can extend it more than once too, right? You could extend I, I it six days way. tonight, and then. And Austin, I think that's what we're saying is for us the worst case scenario on the termination is thirty days because then we've got to redo oh, it again. It, yeah, the it best be case over. is to extend it now, and then we can address it then. Okay, that's fair. That'd be the easiest. You want to go to the second week or in the July. second meeting July. in June or July? July. I don't think we'll be done in June. Sadly, I think you're. Yeah, it's unprecedented. This is, this is, I start, I've been meeting with a lot of groups and, and, and essentially everybody I've talked to and I'm sure, sorry I missed it, we were looking at another landslide that's happened up in Porterville um, and a flooding issue down Young Street, but um, it's unprecedented. And I'm sure Riley told you guys that, that, that what we're dealing with we haven't ever seen before. That includes 83, 2011, 52. We're in uncharted territory. And so I know in 2011, Morgan declared a little bit early because they were confident they would hit the threshold. And we're, we're working on that. But we've got an awful lot to deal with and to come still. That threshold is 50,000, is that correct? Yeah, it's 50 and a little bit. 15. Well, we're at 28,000, sure. 28. what's been yeah, turned in right now, but it's going to be more than that because we've done a lot more work. And then some. That's not very accurate either. Yeah, that's because what I'm there's saying. a lot of people that didn't even know about it and didn't put them. No, in. I'm talking about dollars. Oh, that we've I'm talking spent. about dollars that we've spent so far. Okay. Yeah. Is, so, there, is there any reason why you wouldn't? Yeah. Is there a reason? Declare at this point? I don't see a reason. Especially what we're talking about is declaring an emergency so that we can access emergency funds. That's what federal funds is really what we're talking about. I don't see a downside to to well, what it to takes is, is is when we hit our threshold of fifty thousand, um, the bigger counties obviously have a bigger threshold, and the state has a bigger than that threshold, and so in the other times that we've done declarations, for example, the the wind event. We came in and that I, I sent that to, to Garrett and Mike when we did the wind event. Um, it was declared a federal disaster and we were just kind of the cherry on the top. Davis County and Salt Lake County had millions and millions of dollars damage <coughs> and that's what pushed the state over the threshold. You know, we were just, we were just a part of that. And so I know right now Salt Lake's going to have some significant, maybe I shouldn't say that out loud. There's a few counties in the state of Utah that are going to have some pretty serious issues this upcoming weekend. There's some things that they're getting prepared for. So I think we can do our declaration. I think in the next month you're going to see the majority of the commission, the majority of the uh, other counties will follow suit. So I'm going to declare it for 30 days. And if you want to make an, a motion to extend it to a certain period, so be it. Does that sound good? Yep. Any objections to that? Carry you, carry you. Let's do it. <laughs> do you mind if I respond to Commissioner Wilson? Yes, sorry. Because maybe, maybe some others listening have the same question, like what's the downside? I think the downside would be, you know, is it an overreach of government? Like, what does, do these emergency powers allow? And those are outlined in sex, section 53-2A-205, and it um, allows, um, it says the authority of the chief executive officer includes, and then it has a whole list of things, and it's talking about, you know, utilizing the resources of the political subdivision is reasonably necessary, invoking provisions of mutual aid agreements, 
you know, if we have interlocal agreements. Um, and it does, you know, talk about, like, if it's necessary for preserving life, ordering an evacuation, um, recommending routes, modes of transportation. So it, it kind of gives you the authority to direct traffic and, you know, try to prevent some danger there, you know, ingress, egress to and from disaster areas. And then, um, you know, maybe what, what Commissioner Wilson's thinking about, well, does it allow you to just go on private property and do whatever you need to do? When I read this one, I thought, okay, this is a good provision here because it says clearing or removing debris or wreckage that may threaten public health, public safety, or private property from publicly or privately owned land or waters, except that where there is no immediate threat to public health or safety, the chief executive officer shall not exercise this authority in relation to privately owned land or water unless the owner authorizes the employees of designated local agencies to enter the private land or waters to perform the tasks and the owner provides an unconditional authorization for removal of the debris wreckage and agrees to indemnify the local state government against any claim arising from the removal. And so, you know, I think some of the, the worries with a COVID, like declaring that is, well, what about private property? What about individual rights? Things like that. Um, there are some things built in where we'll stay out of the private yards and you know, property unless they authorize it and agree to indemnify the county. And so I can work with Austin <coughs> to maybe get those forms set up where yeah, we probably have some if we do, if then we do do they're going to indemnify because, you know, if, if we're trying to help, we don't want, you know, no good deed goes unpunished, and sometimes we create liability when we're trying to help someone. And, okay. and, and just following, I, I'd like to put an ex, exclamation point on what Garrett has just said for the fact that I've had people come and say, you need to go on his property and you need to do this, this, and this. And it's like, you know what? It's, it's private property. We, there's, we, there's only a limit of so much that we can do. And so... But if it does, if it's one of those things where it affects our infrastructure, that's generally where we've we've been successful in talking to the landowner, and they've been good. I like the idea of having a, a signed agreement because I know in 2011 they got the agreement, went in, did some work, and then the lady was rather upset because the track coat almost ran over her dog's grave. And there was there was some issues with that where the track call almost ran over the dog's grave. So if we can get a, a document to have people sign, that would be great. So are you going to do that document in advance in case that person is yeah in Timbuktu? Well, we'll we'll. I don't know. Always, we always can before we can always before we enter the because we have to have authorization and, and everyone mm -hmm. has digital now that even if they docu-signed it or something, I don't know, maybe there's some we'll, way we'll to... We'll figure that out. Okay, because I'm just, I'm just concerned about, you know, there might be a problem area that we know is going to happen. We could possibly go to them in advance and talk to them about yeah. that. I mean, such as at 200 feet up on hard scrabble that could cause a major problem for everybody downstream. You know, that's... Just a, it could. I mean, because I think as long as the agreement, the agreement's in place and the owner is authorizing it, we're good. Then it's okay. Okay. But it, but a state of emergency doesn't mean that the emergency manager can just go anywhere in the county and do whatever Nor he feels I. is necessary. Okay. Not that he wants to, but well, you know, well, it, we don't it have doesn't. the resources to just go do whatever. Right. Anyway. Exactly. Yeah. You know. And. And frankly, there's a lot of things that are the responsibility of the private landowner as well. Just because you have flooding doesn't mean it's the county's responsibility to mitigate it and, right? and in every situ situation. And adding to that, I hope a lot of people are listening to, listening to this. We can't financially fund everybody with everything they want. I'm starting to get a lot of landowners calling saying, I got water on my property, will you come fix the riverbank? And that just financially, that's not our responsibility. And ultimately, and 
ultimately it is yeah. our responsibility to, to protect the county's infrastructure. And if Matt Wilson's homes between where the defensible space is and the road, and we protect Matt Wilson's home, well, that's great. But the defensible space, we have to define those areas where it's easiest to defend against flooding. And so it might come down to the, the you might be on the wet side of the line. And so, but people need to understand we can't be everybody's piggy bank on their private property. That's their responsibility. And in talking to one of the contractors we've used a lot, he went through a large portion of East Canyon Creek last year. The owner had some amazing foresight or whatever, Susan Ralston, I'm going to use her name publicly because she's amazing. I wish everybody else in this county would have followed what she did. They went out, they got the correct stream permits, and they fixed her portion, her side, of East Canyon Creek. And there's other streams in this county that would have, we wouldn't be in as, we wouldn't have, we'd have fewer issues if they would have followed what she did. And Because now I've got entire streams that everybody's like, you just need to start at this end and dredge all the way to the other end. I can't do that. You know, what was interesting is back in the 83, 84 year, that was done. I mean, not done. It was it was supposed to have been done to prepare for an eventual one 20 or 30 years later. Well, 40 years later, people got complacent, and those nice, wonderful ditches that we have, or had, are have not been kept up, and because of it, now we got more flooding. And, it and is it, the one in Porterville at East Canyon, I mean, in, it is it, it in is. Highway 66, that was a major one. That if if people had gone and kept that cleaned like they're supposed to, it never would have had a problem. But our problem is is complacency, and that's where I think we have to be concerned about complacency in the future. Also, in in speaking with Commissioner Anderson. Um, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of projects come out of this that we're going to have things to do for the next few years. Okay. You got Thank another you. one. Yeah. Another yeah. One. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks, Austin. And thanks. To you. Okay. So we declared a Is state everybody of emergency. With that? Okay. Yeah, I am. So I'm going to sign it right now. We're going to declare. State of emergency due to flooding in Morgan County. This this does expire 30 days from today. If you want to do something now, that's great. If you want to wait 30 days, well, we probably do 28 days because that's when our meeting is. That's fine too. Yeah. So did it say in there that we need to make a we need to add it to the motion? Is that what you said in that? It just said that upon said motion, motion. Let's see. It just says the legislative body of a county may by majority vote extend a state of emergency for a time period stated in the motion. I'll make sure I'm doing it correctly. So, uh, um, so we got to... <laughs> we could also hold off for 30 days because we've already got a state of emergency now. Yeah. And we don't have to do anything for another we can't double up on it so why not just do it in may we could, so, uh, i mean you could say you know we we can ask julie to put it on the may 16th date and then there might be more information about how long it could go or you could just maybe say end of yeah. july and then if it and then you could also move to to stop it earlier yeah, if you you're done it by july 15th yeah i i would like to add a motion to that declaration, I guess, is how you would do it. But that it that it's another thirty days, or our third, or let's see, third Tuesday of June. So our second meeting in June, which would be June twentieth. I think you the should make it the day after the third meeting in June, because then we can extend yeah. it in the third meeting. June twenty-first. Won't have expired. That I day. was going to put a time on there. 
<laughs> so June 21st <laughs> June is the 21st. day after. Yes. I can second that. We okay, have a motion and a second to extend the state of emer emergency that's been declared for flooding in Morgan County to June 21st, 2023. I'll second it. All those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Now, um, there's another issue that we have to do with the flooding, if it's okay. Sure. Go ahead, Corey. Okay, as of, <clears throat> you guys budgeted 28000 for the floods. Um, that 28000 is gone. And however, I think we talked the other day about money that was left over from the 83 floods. Wayne and I went in today and found out there right now there is $328,000 in that account for flooding. We are depleted. We have no money. That's the flood fund or is that the 83 flood fund? That, that is the two flood. accounts. That's that, the regular flood fund that comes from actually, the taxes, right? No, we can, no we've depleted that. There's only $1,500 in that one. Yeah, so when That's we were true. budgeting last year, we put a $28,000 on the flood fund. Well, there's there was two, now there's one for that flood fund. I don't know how and where it disappeared to, but we only have, we had the $279,000 from last year, plus now whatever is here, and it makes it a total of $328,000 total. And that includes that 1983 fund. So, oh, sorry, so it's, is this different than what the email that Chair Newton sent out at 401 today? Well, I didn't no, read that No, it's one. the same thing. My suggestion is, and I sent this to Leslie, yes, we've spent out of the out of what we budgeted from our general fund, but we'll have to do a, a budget amendment to move money from the flood fund into that fund. My suggestion is we let it go in the red in our general fund. So out of the emergency management fund, we just go into the red. Here in a couple of months when we know what we've spent, we can do transfer. a budget amendment to transfer that, that money. We'll also need to do a budget amendment to transfer the money in from the state grant that's going to pay for our next item and potentially, hopefully, some FEMA money that we can transfer in as well. So, I'm fine with that. And I sent her an email just letting her know so that they don't stop payment, which I think they started to do is say yeah, no more payments. Yes. That. Letting her know, no, <laughs> we're okay. We know it's going to go into the red. Let it happen. Let it happen. Because there's no point in us transferring money today when we have no idea how much is going to need to be transferred, if that makes sense. Is yeah. everybody on the commission okay with that? Yeah, I'm okay with that. However, I'm just going to reiterate something else here. In 1984, they set up that bill levy that comes out of our taxes every single year. It's $1.50 for each, about, for each one of us. That's almost used up every single year. I'm wondering if, after this is all done and said, that we may have to increase that for the next event 40 years from now, or 30 years. I won't be around. Matt may not be around. He may. 40 years from now. <laughs> but I want... <laughs> but what I'm just saying is, is we may want to look at that so that way we're prepared the next time around. And that would have to be increased as a, it would be a truth in taxation. Right, right. As part of our budget process. But right. certainly something we ought to consider. But we ought to consider it if, if that happens. Yeah. Just to Among help out the, the situation. we're going to have to work on. Because yeah. yeah. mitigation, I mean, that's supposed to be a mitigation fund. And, and that's why it's been spent is because we use it for right. things that need to be mitigated. But... That's and a good, very so, good point. so anyway, just as a thought, but I'm okay with. So I think we're good. Okay. We'll we'll just continue we'll to go charge to that account. Yeah. We're going to go into the red, which is fine because we know where the the fund source is to replenish it. Okay, that works. Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Commissioner Wilson. This is another ratification. Um, this is the state gave. <clears throat> A seventy thousand dollars to buy a equipment for the mitigation of flooding. Um, 
we did go through the bidding process, got mm -hmm. several bids. We went with the lowest bid. Um, we still are $6,000 over. Um, if we, with with the trailer and the Mini X that we purchased, so that's less than that was a lot less. Anyway, ninety-four thousand was just for the other Mini X, and so and from everything I, I know, there were some concerns about it. But it, from I did check and talk to people that have had them and done it. They, they've liked them, so I feel comfortable with that. They will deliver that tomorrow. Oh, oh good. And we already took delivery on the trailer, right? Correct. That's great. That's good. So, okay. And that will be a trailer and a ba and a mini X that we can pull behind the one ton. Correct. Okay. Bump, good. It's a bumper pull. Okay. It should be good because we've got well, a lot of tilt deck trailer. Pulling. Sounds like our other trailer's gone. Yeah. Our other trailer's got some issues. I think they were hoping to have it fixed here. We need it to be yeah, operational in this next two months. Yep. Okay. Um, we need we have a motion on this item. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we ratify the purchase of a new 2023 Sani SY60 hydraulic excavator and trailer from, was the trailer from Atlas? Yes, Atlas Equipment. Uh, both from Atlas Equipment. Oh no, the trailer is from Wasatch Trailers. Okay. Sorry. The excavator I, I from Atlas Equipment and the trailer from Wasatch Trailers. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to ratify the purchase uh, of this equipment. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Wonderful. Thank you. Commissioner Wilson, back to you. Uh, rifle range days for employees. So I included in the packet the third Saturday of each quarter of the year, the last month, one way or another we end up with right in the middle of the winter, so I just ended up so that they could do it around Christmas time if they wanted to. So some people do still, so they, they do. Test out their new guns. Yep. <laughs> So anyway, that those are the three dates. I put it in the packet if you're okay with that. I, I'm fine with allowing them to have those days and I guess just first come, first serve on it, you know. That's wonderful. I think it's a great idea. And so who will they schedule that with? Same process mm -hmm. now? Same okay. process. Okay, but it will be open up during that day. Correct. She's going to reserve the day for them and then they can get on and just reserve it online. Okay. Okay. Okay, we have a motion on item eight. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the employee appreciation rifle range days for the third Saturday of March, June, September, and December 2023. I'll second it. A motion, a second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay, we're getting close here to seven for our presentation. Let's let's jump to item we're, ten and then we'll come back tonight. To Are you good to go? We're ready. I think brother, uh, brother, sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Wilson, doesn't he need a break about now? For <laughs> we can take a quick Usually. break. Let's do that. Let's right. take a quick break. I'm good with that. And go <laughs> forward with our presentation. I'd like to pay attention. <laughs> He's a long ways from you, Brandy. <laughs>
Bureau. A month ago, it was a good idea to put it on the agenda. <clears throat> Just, I was waving at you. I'm almost old as him. Back in 84, they did go back and dredge the entire river. And what it is, is you had sandbars and trees and everything else like that. And, they had local contractors just took their cats and worked up and down the river. And I don't know if it was under emergency or whatever circumstances. So you may not want to remove that emergency declaration for a long time. Yeah. But anyway, a month ago, we each year in Farm Bureau, we have what's called issue surfacing meeting. And we're going to do that tonight. But we wanted to come a chance, talk to you folks a little bit, and tell you a little bit what's going on in Farm Bureau. And the thing is, is we have issue surfacing meeting across the entire state in every county and then we gather up and we evaluate those issues that we have and we put them in a policy manual so when we go to legislature or county commissioners or the federal government we can identify those issues and and then we have backing that yeah as a farm bureau we support this or we don't support that and so that's why we do this issue surfacing process um, this is a stressful time for us ranchers. I just talked to uh, farmers here in the county. I just talked to uh, Jason Lott out there, and expectations are that the ranchers are going to lose at least 30% of their calves this year. The sheep guys, they don't know what they're going to do. They're just getting ready to land now. And when I called Shane Pence to remind him of this meeting this morning, he says, oh, man, I'm out here on the desert. I forgot all about it. He says, we're shearing sheep. So they had the opportunity to shear, so they, they've shorn their sheep today. So anyway, so I'm here. We have a couple of people from the state here with us tonight, uh, Farm Bureau. We have Sakia White. She's our regional manager. She works a number of counties. Anyway, Jim Wayman, he's uh, on the board of directors, and he represents Morgan and Summit and Weaver County. And I had to get away from it because both of us are about ready to start crying because we've had such a bad spring. And it, 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 it's really stressful, um, personally. Usually, this, I put my cattle out on my range, this, usually between now and the 10th of May, there's two foot of snow there. I don't know where I'm going to go with them. And, and I'm not alone. It's just, anyway. So it's, it, we have local issues. One, one we've dealt with and locally was a trespass at the state of Utah Farm Bureau backed us up. Uh, water, in every region of the state, there's different issues, like out in the you in a basin, they have issues with, uh, you have, somebody owns the ground, somebody else owns the mineral rights, mineral rights leases to the oil company. The oil company comes in and puts down a, an oil well, but the guy that owns the ground can't run his pivot anymore because the, the oil well site's in the way. So those are the kind of issues, and we as a state farm bureau stand behind those kind of issues. And, and we negotiate back and forth and, and, and cover those issues and then, like I said, when we come forward, currently one of, one of the issues we're faced with in the federal thing, is, this is ironic, it's called the Waters of the United States, and, the, and we have bureaucracies that declare stuff, the EPA and stuff like that. When, when it's a flood, it's not their water. When there's no water, it's all theirs. And, and the Waters of the United States is basically saying, if you have a puddle on your property, they have jurisdiction over that puddle. And so we keep saying as Farm Bureau, this is private ground, private water rights. So these are the kind of conflicts and issues that as Farm Bureau come up with. I've talked a little bit about this. What I'd like to do is, you know, if you, as I talk, you think if there's an issue that you would like to see us address to help you as the county commissioners, and that's agriculture based, but we don't always deal with just agriculture issues. Uh, when we have a, a, a family here in the valley that sells raw milk. And they've created kind of a niche thing, but raw milk's pretty pretty dangerous issue because if something goes bad, the media people say raw milk's bad, all milk is bad as soon as you say that. So we have these large dairies that we all enjoy cheap milk from, and so there's these kind of conflicts that we have to deal with in Farm Bureau. <clears throat> One of the conflicts is we have a, we have a saying at home is how many times you have to tell a lie before it becomes the truth. Uh, think about that. I, I was in with a youth group once, and and some the, the presenter asked that question, and the kids just kind of sat there, and I thought, holy cow, that's the truth, you know. We've had this saying that in Morgan County, it's only once or twice you have to tell a lie before it becomes the truth. No, no offense. 
<laughs> but do you realize that the Great Salt Lake is not going to fill this year because of the alfalfa growing in in, in Utah? <clears throat> I can pretty much guarantee that all the alfalfa that's growing in Morgan, Summit, Weber County never leaves this valley. It pretty much stays there and it gets used. But yet the media says that that's the alfalfa is the reason the Great Salt Lake's empty. So we've got to quit growing alfalfa. Southern parts of the state, yeah, that's the case. They, they grow alfalfa down there and they export it. I don't know of anybody up north. There may be some in, in Box Elder County that do the export. But we want to run our farms, but yet we have to have a PR arm too to cover, our, to cover the truth. In last year's issues, two things we talked about was wildfire, I mean, excuse me, wildlife and drought. Can you imagine that? Our concerns in the issue meeting last year was whether they would come and take our water to fill the Great Salt Lake. What a difference a year makes, huh? And uh, so those are the things. Uh, the wildlife thing, we sat in a DWR meeting the other night. They collar deer and track them. They're deer with collars north of the freeway in, in the South Rich and Morgan District. 70% of those collared deer have died. And they, they have twice as many elk on that side than what they're supposed to have. And then over here on East Canyon, they have almost double the amount of elk that their, their objective calls for. I came, when I came to Morgan tonight, I noticed there about 80 head of elk on Mike Morgan's place on Stoddard Lane. Yep. And they were feeding those elk earlier. Two weeks ago, they were feeding them on the mountain. They quit feeding them. Now they come back to the valley. So here you got Mike Morgan's trying to grow some grass to feed his cows to manage and anyway, so those are the kind of issues that we face as Farm Bureau, as your agriculture people. And uh, are there issues you see that you would like us to address as a Farm Bureau to take the state Farm Bureau people to, to help support you in your county positions or that you think would be efficient, uh, better for, for agriculture in the county? And I'd like to point out that once a farm sold here in Morgan County, it don't come back because up the road from me, they just sold 20 acre lots at $50,000 a lot, an acre. And I, I can't grow much alfalfa. It don't matter if I export it to China or not. I can't, I can't buy that ground and make it work. So you have to understand if the farmers go away, other dollars are going to gobble up that ground. And, and you look at any of the master plans or anything, everybody wants the agriculture to stay. And there's, it, it's more of a challenge every day. So I'd open you up to any questions. Your Sakia or Jim can answer questions for you there. Jim's, uh, like I said, on the board of directors. One thing I'd like to point out is next year the National Farm Bureau Convention will be held in Salt Lake City. And that will be quite a shock. Last year it was Puerto Rico, right? Did you go? I did. Was it worth going? It was terrible. <laughs> Are you going to go to Salt Lake next year? I probably will. Maybe. Yeah, but I'll have to wear a coat. <laughs> so anyway, but that that will be in January. There will be the Farm Bureau Convention, and they're starting to, to plan up and get ready for that. There's other folks that come in. We've got Jill Singleton over here on, on has just stepped in. We have the Clark family here that they are quite active in the in the Farm Bureau. And, and uh, anyway... So are you just going to meet in this building? Yeah, we're all oh, going to okay. go down to the end. And so if you folks are bored and don't want to go home early, come on down. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are the true attractive nuisance. I think there's three ladies that come and watch you every two weeks. I do not understand the attraction. <laughs> <laughs> but you get a quiet evening at least once uh, every two when weeks. When she comes home, I pause the television, give her a half hour to vent what you guys did. <laughs> Uh oh, we're we're hearing all your secrets now. Then. And, then, and then I think I've heard it all. I push the button and away I go. I can be but pretty it's late. interesting coming here tonight to hear Weber Basin. Um, you know, Jared's on the board there. You know, they're having to make decisions that they they just put an impact fee on. When if I want to drill a well in Peterson, or if I want to be in Peterson Pipeline, I have to. Put, exchange a water share into that. As I understand it, years ago you used to rent one acre foot and it's got up to about $400 a share around in that ballpark. 
Now they only lease you, was it 0.65, Jerry, mm -hmm. of acre feet, because they're running out of water to lease. And out of that, they, they put an impact fee on you. And that impact fee is $9,000. But then the, the, the annual rental is a little bit less, but the impact fee is almost $10,000. And the, the other thing that this creates is that my private water rights went up about mm, 10 times value because I have agriculture water that I could convert to culinary water. And if I charge $10,000 plus I lease it, what do I grow an alfalfa for? So those are the kind of dynamics that agriculture is faced with right now. And anyway, so open up any discussion. If these folks, I'll, I'm here at the podium, but if these folks, if you have a question, they want to chime in, That'd be great. Yeah, that'd and be you can see some of the policies if you open the forward. I mean, not all the policy stuff is just agriculture. Uh, there's, we, we, you, you look at the table of comments and, and it identifies agriculture issues and then a number of things that we as citizens of the United States, we have interest in too. So Randy, you, you hit on something that I've long been concerned with and that is the rising property values. Um, once you plant a house, that's the last crop. Exactly. And <clears throat> with property values being what they are, you know, I, I farm a small amount in Croydon. I could farm my entire lifetime and never make enough on my 100 acres to buy one acre, to be quite honest. What do we do to combat that? How do you deal with that? I mean, well, as long you, as property values are... That's what are, you guys are coming down and telling us for here in a minute. We're, <laughs> we're just farmers. We want, we want to be farmers. My, Bruce wants to milk those cows twice a day, no matter what. He doesn't want to worry about this other stuff. I don't know. I mean, property values being what they are, it makes it really hard. You know, someday Bruce is going to retire. Right. And, and what's he going to do with the farm? Because one of his kids probably can't afford to buy the rest out at those kind of values. What do you do? Right. You know, I... I look back and I think maybe maybe they had it right when they used to just hand everything to the oldest son of the oldest son because at least it stayed in one piece and you could still farm because you start splitting it up and then there's not enough to make anything. And but that, that's the very thing that is, in my view, what has driven Morgan County is nobody ever had to buy <coughs> enough money to buy the other one out, so they just split it and yeah. split it and split it. And then, then they fought because that uncle got away with the best part. Mm -hmm. and, and you... You'll run into family circumstances here in the valley where that still kind of bounces around. You know, Uncle Joe got away with the best part. Right. Th those kind of things. Um, Debbie was listening to a, a planning thing not too long ago, and it talked about conservation easements. So I guess that would be it. But who's, which one of your kids are you going to curse to say you stay on the farm? I have three sons. Each of them net what we gross on the farm by quite a bit. And which one of my kids am I going to curse to come and say, "Yep, they they all they all have a little, little bit of acreage." They you know, but they all understand the dynamics of the deal. Yeah. And when you when you start buying a a tractor that costs you two hundred thousand dollars, and that's the little ones, you can buy buy a big combine if you live in the Midwest for a million bucks now. And they still break down. And, and, and some of the other issues that in Farm Bureau we've just recently faced is... They won't when they're electric. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> no, they're just going to die. Until <laughs> you recharge the battery. <laughs> what a sense of good you have. <laughs> but when you get it in the river and it shorts out, then you... <laughs> but it, those are the kind of things that we're faced with. It, it's like John Deere, there's just been a struggle and the Farm Bureau's been involved in it. They, they wouldn't let you, you couldn't hire anybody else to work on your equipment other than a farm, uh, uh, John Deere mechanic. And so does Farm Bureau, is it, do they have a lobbyist group or something? Oh, we do. We have lobby, at the Utah legislature, we have guys that are on staff that are lobbyists. They go there. Uh, farm Even Bureau on the federal level, they farm do? Farm Bureau has major offices in, in uh, Washington, D.C. that they, you know, they're, they're involved in lobbyists. And... and and we're encouraged to, we, we all know our legislators, because we're so few, and, and the Farm Bureau encourages to know our legislators, and we keep our hands in touch with them. You know, like, the best thing ever happened in Morgan County is we have three state senators right now. The way we're chopped up, 
we have three state senators. That's great. I know Ann Milner. I know uh, Mr. Adams and then Mr. Johnson. And why shouldn't I know them? Because three out of 20, was 28 or 29? 29. At the legislature. So those, were, as Farm Bureau members, we're encouraged to do that. But yet, really down deep, we'd like to stay home and take care of the farm. Any issues that you can see as you look at that, I mean, the mission statement or those table of contents, you know, I mean, we, it, 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 those are the things that the Farm Bureau has interest in. To be honest, a lot of the legislation that we saw at the legislature this last year on water was there, there were tugging taken on in the Farm Bureau about what, what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And these board of directors guys, they, how often do you meet, Tim? Pardon me. How, how often do you guys meet? Once a month. I see, and they go to the board director and they chew that stuff up and then, anyway, it's, and not all farmers look at each other, you know, on this, so it, it, it's, 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 farm, we, we got into a, a real challenge and we've, we've been involved with Farm Bureau because of the support they gave us as a private property owner. And uh, so, anyway, but it's, th those are issues. We're going to go down, like I said, there's a few of us here tonight. When we had this meeting a month ago, we're, we're encouraged to have these issues ra raising times, uh, this, these meetings once a year. And this a April this year for farmers is hard. You know. Anyway, I mean, the, I, I, you can't get on your fields to plan. Uh, there's, you know. I have a field that I drove across yesterday that's usually solid sod. I was seeing a tractor six inches in the ground because of the so much water in there. Uh, you know, anyway, it just, so I'm anticipating a real shortage of feed this year, especially if I can't get onto the, you know, anyway, but I'm not alone. Go talk to your constituents up in Croyd and those, those sheep boys, ask them what they're going to do. They don't know. Then, then the elk have come down and eaten the low feed. Usually they start lambing those lambs and they move them up the hill and let it feed. The elk have cleaned all the low feed. So what are the sheep going to eat in the mud? Anyway, it, it's, it's going to be a trying time for agriculture. And that's when those prices that somebody that has 10 acres or 100 acres is going to say, man, I'm tired of doing this. I'm going to sell it. And I don't know. You know, the conservation easements, there's transfer of development rights. There, there, there's lots of stuff out there, but it, you've got a lot of... A lot of different ways to look at it, Mike. So I don't, I don't, I don't if I had the answer, do you think I'd be standing here? <laughs> anyway, we appreciate your time and your, you know, I'm sure you guys, phones are ringing off the wall. Everybody wants you to come and fix their flooding problem. And uh, I, I tell you, it ain't getting any better. You guys are going to have, I made a bet out here at the Weaver Basin, guys. 24th of July at 11 o'clock is when the flood stage will be over this year. <laughs> Any other questions by Farm Bureau people have? That's when the fireworks will go off. Then. That that would be it. We'd set the place on fire. I hope we can do that, Bobby. <laughs> anyway. I wish somebody within Farm Bureau would do what I suggested a while ago, and I've been talking with Farm Bureau on it. What's that? And that is to revamp your green belt laws so that those that are truly in agriculture get the benefit and those that are not in agriculture don't. And this is where, okay, now, now we have a discussion. This is my decision. I mean, my, my would cure the problem. And every year when I do taxes, I do a Schedule F. Do you guys all do Schedule Fs? Mm -hmm. You don't. You live on a lot. If you don't have a schedule left in your taxes, why do you get Greenbelt? I agree with you 100%. And maybe that's something we, at the issue we can talk about, but uh, what you have is the politics of Salt Lake County. You have somebody that has six acres and lives in Mill Creek that has a horse pasture, and he talks to his legislature, legislator, and he wants Greenbelt so he don't have to pay the $10,000 yeah. uh, a year on that. And so those, there, there's dynamics, but... That would be my solution, is if you file a Schedule F, you qualify for Greenbelt. I can agree with that. I have, but, we have neighbors. But we that, need to change the law, and from what I've been told by the legislator, legislature, is that now is the time that we can do that, and they would be receptive to that. So we need to, as a group in the Farm Bureau, we need to get together to discuss that issue and see if we can find somebody that will help to write 
that new law because the law currently is from 1969. And if we go and redo that, um, I think it would benefit the agriculture and not just have people that own ground to own the ground and right. put a horse on it. If you had a, co if you had a conversation with Gwen Rich, she'll say, well, I'll, I should get a report to somebody that has ground that's not being used. Right. And she'll go down and make an appointment, and that day there's two horses standing on the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's that's how that's taken care of. But, um, and to your point, too, I think this last legislative session was really good for testing the waters as to how reopening Greenbelt would sit in some different counties. Because we have had this Schedule F conversation um, for the, at least the time that I've been here, so going on two years. And so, and I do think it's a good idea. And like I said, we did get two, um, well, the account, the Lee McAllister firms and some stuff like that. There was at least three bills that come through that passed in regards to Greenbelt changing some of those things and looking at that ruling and so i do think we are in an environment now where introducing the schedule of tax, tax break situation will be better received and something that we can definitely move forward on yeah and I, hope, I, I hope it will happen the one i don't know about it or like s corporations how those are treated whether they have, they have a schedule f or if it's just they'll you know, figure I, out a way to do it but that, that, that would be <laughs> okay thank you it's, other stuff and the green belt would you know, in our community, it would help quite a bit. There, there, there might, you know, the, the elk management programs in the county, Right. That, that might change that thing a little bit, too. So anyway, thank you. Any other questions? I think you're It's still daylight there. outside. You guys can't go home yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're not. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank we, you. We, we, we'll, we will be down in the auditorium if you get done. It sounds great. I, Ed showed up, Ed Wild showed up, and I, I don't know where the other brothers are. He doesn't either. <laughs> yeah, you got the best one of them. That's right. Because right. yeah, I'm the most quiet, so then. <laughs> you can't have Logan here, you never get the podium back. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Okay, we're going to move to item number 10 uh, Commissioner Fackrell. This is approval of the oh, state yeah. broadband grant. So basically, we've already approved it. We approved last time in advance of our getting the approval for the... It basically, there was two approvals, and we only approved one. One of them, the one last time, was with Horox, the, the contractor, to do the study. And this one here is we just have to approve this broadband grant that is coming to us to pay for Horox. And... Uh, Okay, so that's all it is, it's and you've $30, got that. $30,000. Yeah, the 30000 and we have to record that as a budget item. We have to put it into the budget resolution and next time and put that in as an increase in budget, and then we expend it right back out. And Garrett has already gone through the contract, and he says he'd give us any more items. Have you you've received the contract or not, Mike? Yep, I received it and I've signed it. Okay, so it's basically a ratification. So we're ratifying this. So the one that I received from Blaine, it still had Morgan County government. Yeah, but we changed but the it. the one that I saw in the email that the person said that they've removed and updated that. Yeah. And so what you signed had the update, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. And I, I signed it because I assumed that we had approved it because we had approved the deal with Horox, and that's where the funding was coming from. Right. But it sounds like we need to we did it backwards. the approval of that. Right. All right. I, it looked like the same agreement to me, to be honest. I, I read through it yeah. again, and I said, I think I've already reviewed this, and it was you already did. approved, but I could be wrong. You did. Okay. Okay. So what would the ratification be? So it's just approval grant. of the state broadband. Okay. I'll, I'll move that we ex we approve the acceptance of the state broadband grant. Ratify it, I guess. It's already approved and we're ratifying. I'll second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay, we are on to section G, our public hearing. Josh, this is the... Um, Family Food Production Code Amendment that was discussed and we held a hearing 
a few weeks ago. Thanks. Um, so at the public hearing that we held a, uh, four weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, uh, it was continued to today uh, because there were some questions that uh, Commissioner Fackville brought up and some concerns from the, uh, the, the, the public. Um, so uh, I sat down with Commissioner Fackrell. We've made a, a few changes to address that. Um, I'll just go through those. Uh, we've deleted the definition of family food, produ family food production light, and uh, we've kept family food production. Family food production will apply to um, all smaller single-family residential lots. Um, as denoted in uh, use table 8-5B-3. Uh, all family food production, uh, agriculture related uh, uses in the large lots is just an outright permitted use. So we didn't feel like we needed to keep the large, large lot section. So we deleted that. Um, family food production animals is the, uh, the section A. Uh, we doubled all the amounts of animals that uh, people would be allowed to have, uh, and we added a 4-H or livestock program allowance, uh, which basically states that there would be a limit of um, one lamb or kid per child in a family that wants to do that, um, and that uh, raised for purpose of 4-H or similar agricultural programs. Um, as far as anything else, uh, Everything else is pretty much the same. There's two things that were not deleted out that I think need to be deleted out uh, to avoid any confusion in the future. One, uh, we deleted the provision that it applied to all lots that were 10,000 square feet or larger. We deleted that. So the asterisks next to the P for permitted uh, underneath farm or next to farm animals uh, need to be deleted. And then the definition for agriculture, including grazing, pasturing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in 8-5B-3 needs to be deleted as well. If you have any questions, I can answer them now. What was the second deletion? That we need to make? Yeah. So um, in 8-5B-3 use regulations in that table, mm -hmm. uh, the first deletion would be to delete out the, uh, the bolded definition for agriculture since oh, okay. we've uh, added farm animals and the farm animals will regulate on the smaller smaller lots and the uh, the change that Commissioner Fackrell asked was that it applied to all single family residential lots regardless of size. Gotcha. Yeah, I think this encompasses what we talked about last time very well. So appreciate your work, Commissioner Fackrell and Josh on that. It was touch and go there a little bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions <laughs> for staff? So Commissioner Fackrell, um, on A-6-46A2, mm -hmm. okay. does, that, does that read according to what you... Mm -hmm. I'm like, fine with it because we went through and those, we did it. What's that? How would you come up with those numbers? That was basically <clears throat> what was there before. And uh, and as far as the amount, I mean, the, the, you got to look at it, what we're trying to do. This is a family food production. If we have to go and take care of ourselves, that's what I determined that we determine, I can't say I, we determined is the amount that you could actually feed a family. Uh, I mean, especially in partic particular um, chickens, if you had up to 25 chickens, you can have two dozen eggs a day. And if you by chance had to have the meat and you didn't want to kill the chickens, you could have rabbits because rabbits, if you have 10 rabbits, you're going to have 80 rabbits to butcher in a less than three months time so um, you know it's just a just an item that uh, you know can happen if you by chance are in need of food because that's the main purpose of this ordinance was to have food production and uh, it's not to necessarily be in agriculture it's just to have food production and allows people to have that food production 
and that was the reasoning for it. Because if I want to be in agriculture, I'm going to be in agriculture, but it's going to be in a different spot. And I apologize, I wasn't here the lot. Well, I was on the phone. You were on the phone. So I didn't quite yeah. understand all this. But so on, on to can you have a combination of all? Yes. So you can have the maximum that's mm -hmm. shown. So you can have two sheep, 25 pheasants, 10 geese, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. okay. No, the wording is or. So you could have, because we're talking about small, smaller lots here. That's what I just wanted to verify. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's if you have two sheep, that's it. That's what you don't you have. have. You yeah. can't have a chicken and two sheep. That's correct. If you want to have two sheep, then you can have two sheep. Uh, the but only that's... caveat to that is the next item, the 4-H or yeah, livestock. livestock. That does allow families to, who want to participate in that to have a lamb or a goat per in child. In addition their to their 25 chickens. In addition to, yeah. Mm, that may not work then. <laughs> yeah, I understand I the logic be, behind that. Yeah. Yeah. If you had 25 pheasants and 25 chickens and 25 rabbits right. and two sheep on a on a piece of eighth of an acre, eighth lot, of an acre well, lot, you'd probably be in work. trouble. So I, I think I understand the logic. But you can that. have you can have a combination of those things up to those limits. Sure. Well, that's what I was saying, but you're saying no. Oh. So can no. you have so you can you have two sheep? Can you have twenty five no. pheasants? If you wanted no. one sheep, or one sheep, then you could have twelve pheasants. twelve chickens or twelve pheasants. So I oh percentage wise, if, if right, yeah. so. times come to that, we're going to have to barter. Blank. That's right. right. <laughs> that's exactly so right. We're, some people are going to raise rabbits, and some are going to raise chickens, and some are going to raise goats. That's right. God forbid oh, we have to drink that stuff, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, uh, on now. Got my dad worked first. with a, Jew, a doctor who was um, he was Jewish, and uh, they got talking about um, family uh, food. You know, um, the uh, year supply of food, and the, the my dad's friend says, "Well, you know, Jews have uh, they have food supply too, right?" And my dad's like, "I didn't know that." And he's like, "Yeah, it's a gun and the nearest Mormon's house." <laughs> 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 There's also another part of that that um, it goes along with the food production code, and that is is under B. If it becomes a nuisance, you can always go to him to take care of that nuisance. If by chance somebody there that says, "Well, I'm going to have five chickens and I'm going to have two lambs too." So if you feel like that is becoming a nuisance, I guess you can go to him and have it corrected. But the law states this. Who's him? I'm just only He's the administrator. Oh, okay. He's oh, the administrator. Okay, got it. Current Hopefully staffing we can levels. talk as neighbors and yeah. resolve those and not have to go to Josh. Well, current staffing levels mean that we only enforce based on complaint. So unless I get it, if I don't get a complaint, then I don't know. I don't want to know. I got plenty of other stuff to do. Yeah, you do. Well, I'm glad you could take my chickens two years ago. Yeah, me too, and the foxes enjoyed doing them. <laughs> <laughs> I still oh. have one, and she lets me pet it. <laughs> Trained her well. Okay, any further questions? So that means you can have some more there. Um, here. You can have more chickens yeah, if you, you like. Yeah, you can have them again. Okay. Is there he a, wants his chicken back, please. Is there a... <laughs> You number to this ordinance or <laughs> well do we need to open we up need a, to open up a policy oh, yeah, sorry, a period but I forgot yeah it'll be um, I don't even know what it'll be is it? Morgan County Code section 8-2 8-5 and 8-6 2 8 oh it's right there on there okay all right with that I checked being the motion said, it should be correct <laughs> perfect let's uh, you did? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look for a motion to move into, to adjourn the public meeting and convene a public hearing. So I'll moved. Move. Second. A motion, a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we are now in public hearing. Opportunity for the public to address the commission. Uh oh. I think you guys are in trouble. It's all right. I don't care. Nothing different. Okay. I know we're getting late in the meeting and it's getting lightheart, but 
So I've tried to write this down. Tina Kelly, Mountain Green. With all due respect, because you guys know that I do respect what you do and the process that you go through. This has been a confusing process to follow. The original request came to the Planning Commission. It was made to make a change to allow a horse where it wasn't allowed in a half acre zone or more than one horse in a half acre zone. Now it doesn't even talk about horses, it doesn't include horses. Added then, raising chickens was added in, which I understand the reasons why that was because I've talked to, to the affected person in Mountain Green who, who requested that. This has completely changed from what was heard in the Planning Commission public hearing and what was presented in the last commission meeting. So, I think, but you guys let me know and do what you're going to do, does the Planning Commission recommendation stand or shouldn't it be remanded back to the Planning Commission for them to review, the, because these are our big changes, for them to review the changes and make a new recommendation. Also, this is just probably technical, but very complicated to read and understand what changed unless you followed the process from the beginning. The new changes are not highlighted in red so that the reader is aware that they are changes and how significant they are. It is difficult to read and understand as it is currently presented. It is uncertain what has been removed from the original draft. It appears that the draft that you saw last time has been thrown out and this looks like a new draft. And to the statement that it will be enforced if a neighbor complains, staff doesn't have time for code enforcement now. You don't have enough staff to do code enforcement. And I do not see this being enforced and it shouldn't be a matter of a neighbor calling to complain on a neighbor. That's just not good ordinance. Thank you. Yep, you're okay. Okay. <clears throat> My name's Leslie Hurst. I'm a lifelong resident of Morgan County, and I'm very proud of our, already of what you've accomplished with what we've t discussed and your willingness to listen to public comment concerning this. Um, <clears throat> my only concern with what was presented today pertains to lambs and goats. They do not thrive well individually. So creating an ordinance where it would be okay to have one, the survival rate decreases substantially. So I would recommend a minimum of two because they are a flock and herding type of an animal. They just don't do up on their own. So it might be opening it up for a bad situation for kids who are having those 4-H experiences that if they're only allowed to have one, the odds of it surviving to the fair would be very minimal. So that would be my only concern with what was, what was submitted today, but otherwise I think it sounds wonderful. I'm excited that we're pushing forward on it. Okay. Seeing no more um, public <coughs> comment, we'll look for a motion to adjourn the public hearing and reconvene the public meeting. So moved. A motion. I'll second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. I, ha I do. Um, can I speak? Absolutely. <laughs> so. Of course I do. Um, <laughs> That's kind of boy, you never asked. <laughs> I guess I didn't think about the the uh, amount of changes we made, and and I don't know if that should go back to the planning commission and get their stamp of approval on what we've all done. I don't know how that all works. I, I'm gonna let's ask our attorney what his. So I pulled a eight dash three dash four. This is subsection E of our Morgan County Code. It says the county council shall schedule and hold a public hearing on the application as provided in section 8-3-12 of this chapter. Following the public hearing, the county council may approve, approve with modifications, or deny the proposed amendment. Prior to making a decision that goes contrary to the Planning Commission's recommendation, the county council may, but is not obligated to, remand the amendment to the Planning Commission with a request for another recommendation with additional or specific considerations. The Planning Commission shall review such request as specified in subsection D of this section. So you may, but you're not obligated to. Okay. My yeah, other... So we may if it's in contrary, <laughs> right? I guess the other question is, is it in contrary or is it 
No, I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't even know. remember hearing about a horse. I, I don't think it would be contrary <laughs> in that it's amended from what they gotcha. recommended. Okay. Not contrary, like like opposite, opposite, but just, just different. Different because you amended it Fair from enough. what they recommended. But the allowance was to allow for modifications with approval. So. The question so it is, is discretionary, I guess, is, yeah. is well, the main point. What it's was May. the deal with the horse? Do you don't remember a horse deal? We addressed that? All I know is when I was hired 10 months ago, I was asked to modify this. I looked at the existing code that was proposed back then. I modified it accordingly. I don't know anything about horses. Well, I think this is for... Um, half acre zones and less not more right is that correct 1-20 is um, is a half acre lot yeah if you own awesome. a horse in a half acre lot I guess you could if it's a Shetland or a Welch well you just have to feed it non-stop yeah that's true you're, you'd always have to do that. That's because we went from a large, we decided large was anything agriculture and above. That's half acre and above. Anything less than that goes non-agriculture, or doesn't go non-agriculture, it goes into food production. So that's the reasoning. Now, as far as a, a lamb, this was my thinking on it, uh, as far as a lamb having needing two, I did not think at that point of the combination of having chickens too, because in reality, they're not going to interfere. And so that would be something I could recommend having back in there, that you could have a combination of lesser amount of chickens with the two lambs or the two kids or whatever it is. But, um, but we've got to remember that this portion of the code is for food production, family food production. And that's what was brought up to us back 10 months ago was family food production. And so, yes, we did not leave in the old stuff because it was a new ordinance. Now, if it has to go back to planning commission, let them do it. I don't care. I really don't care if it goes back to the planning commission. My concern is, is when it comes back to us, now we're going to go through the same process again. This is an easy fix. Okay. Put That's fine with me. In that, I really don't care. I just want it done. In the use table 8-5B-3, um, I would recommend... Uh, leaving in the agricultural definition for the keeping and grazing of animals and just restrict it to permitted on R120 because then the R120 lots and larger can do anything agriculture related including keeping of horses and whatnot and keep the farm animals restricted to family food lot. production on smaller. all the smaller lots. Yeah, perfect. That's good to me too. Okay, now how do how what is your thoughts on the herd animals? For already four permitted each. two per child, one per well, child. Well, that right? that's a separate exception. So if you only had one child, you could still have two goats. Yeah. You could. Yes. Okay. Oh yes. Or two sheep. Yeah, or two sheep. Goats or sheep. Yeah. And if you had three kids, if you had four kids, you can actually have one per child during that time frame for the 4-H. If you had six kids, which there might be within our county, if they can feel that they can take care of six of them in their backyard, I guess they can do it <laughs> according to this code. Not that I recommend it, but... You know what? It takes up your. You're going to have very many take you up on. That. Yeah, There'll I know. Be a handful of but there okay. could be. I'm just saying it. It's something that is allowable. We try to take care of the 4-H FFA. Um, being able to raise a lamb, and lambs don't take as much as a big sheep, and they aren't as noisy at times. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just, you know, on small goats the same way. So, 
it's up to you guys. I I helped design it, so. I like the amendment that you suggested in addition to what's here. I think with that I would be comfortable with it. It sounds like it addresses the initial concern, which was the horses. And the provision that Garrett read from the county code is consistent with 1727A. Five oh two, yeah. Although they don't have the language about if you want to set it back, it just says you can vote on it after making any revisions the legislative body considers appropriate. That said, I don't have an objection if you want to have them take a look at it again either. I, whatever. I'll look for a motion then. How about it, designer? What's that? How about it? No, I'm just saying go ahead, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to stay away from this time. <laughs> You're right in the middle of it. <laughs> uh, I I can make a motion. Um, I, you're going to have to help me with that last change in particular, though. So, Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve an amendment to the Morgan County Code sections 8-2 definitions, 8-5 zoning districts established in 8-6 supplementary regulations as proposed but with the following modifications um, in table 8-5B-3 5B and deleting the one, two, three, fourth row down agricultural including grazing and pasturing of animals Leave that in we're to address the horse issue. Leaving it on oh. R1-20, right? And leave it permitted R120 only. We're just okay, so we're deleting the permitted use from R112. Well, correct. P, taking the P out of that. Okay. So And deleting the asterisks in farm animals yep. okay. in the I last of the rows. Before you have a second, please. Um, tilling of the soil, what are you meaning by that? Because... That's in the existing code. Okay, so, but if we take it out of that, if we take it out of 1-12, does that mean nobody can in no, small we're not, lots we're not modifying have a garden? Tilling, no, we're not modifying the tilling of soil. Okay. That's a separate line item, and it's permitted in all zones. So if you want to have a garden, okay. you can have a garden. All right, good enough. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion, a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Anderson, Commissioner Comments. Yes. <laughs> Do you have anything you'd like to share tonight? Um, i got to think of all the emails that I've gone through and all the calls and all the work. No, I don't. I don't think any in particular, just grateful for all the residents, all the service that's been putting in. Sandbags are being filled multiple locations and I, I know different wards, different neighborhoods, just a lot of people coming out and doing their best to help out with the flooding situation. So um, publicly thank uh, Sheriff and Emergency Management Director. I think they're handling a lot of situations very well. A lot of situations that could go negative quite quickly and they're, and they're doing a very good job. So. I, I think public comments, that's all I have for now. Okay, great. Um, I, I don't have anything new, um, <clears throat> and you that was very well said. This community is remarkable, and I am floored at the number of volunteer hours that have been reported to the county, and I know that that's probably only a portion of what's actually taken place, but as of, was it yesterday, it was nearly 2,000 hours Volunteer hours had been reported uh, being spent within the county on flood efforts, which is just incredible. It's a lot of time. I mean, that's that's one full-time person for an entire year, 2,000 hours. So it's a lot of work. 
Commissioner McConnell. We have two potential items for the work session at our next meeting. One is the trails plan, um, which we'd like to, to get brought before the commission, and the other would be the area plan for Mountain Green, okay, both of which done. we think would be done. Um, but I don't know that we could... I mean, we, we went through the area plan <laughs> with the consultant. Hours. It was like two and a half hours, and I told them we wouldn't have that kind of time in front of the commission, so I don't know if we want to combine those two. Do you have a preference as to which one is first? or Because maybe we don't want to try to do both in one. Sounds like we better separate city. them. Do you have a preference as to which one comes first? It doesn't matter to me, but to get funding, and well, it doesn't really matter at this point. Fundings are... I think we're okay. We can start going with funding without. So either one. Doesn't matter to me, whichever one you want to do. Okay. Well, we'll make a decision and put one on for the work session next time. Yeah. Sounds great. Okay. We're kind of running out of time with our consultant on the area. Yeah, that's plan. why so I was maybe so maybe we should do that one first. And we've already ran out of time for the trails, so it's all the UDOT that's helping us now. Okay. That's all, all I had. Um, I've got at least two items. Um, yesterday we were in a COG meeting, uh, Jared and I, and they requested that we have a joint meeting of all commissioners, school board members, city council members, as a joint meeting at the next one, which is the third Monday of May. What date was that, Jared? Do you remember? Um, and that 22nd. would be at 4 o'clock. Oh, 15th, sorry, 15th. 15th. Yeah, okay, so we need to have that, and they would like to discuss. I mean, the main purpose in you coming is to discuss amongst all of us um, community development, correct? Yeah. Almost a, yeah, 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 community development, community plan. Community plan, For the that's next right. few years. Right. May 15th at what time? May 15th at 4 o'clock. Okay, I'm out of town. You're out of town? Yep. And I'm going to be out the 16th. That conflicts with my YCC executive board. We, we can see if we can reschedule, but yeah. that, that's a meeting they're thinking of doing. Yeah. Because they re would re really like to have us there. Otherwise, Jared and I just get to do our normal thing. <laughs> and the other thing is, is we at one time had talked about having a potential barbecue in the summer with the county employees and stuff. And we've had donated to us um, a lot of steaks from a company in Ogden that has donated these they're in my freezer and uh, we would just have to purchase a few other things such as all the condiments you can all do the cooking I don't care um, I but there's the t-bones tell the public you've got a lot of steak in your freezer <laughs> I got I've got eight freezers full of beef they want to come <laughs> doesn't go south anytime soon. <laughs> um, they won't because they're a vacuum pack and so Anyway, that is available to us. Uh, it was given to us by Longhorn Steakhouse. Oh, wonderful. So, and so anyway, that would be great. Maybe with the retirement of Gwen, maybe that would be a good timing. Just anyway, that's a thought. And then we just have to purchase hamburger from somewhere for those, whatever we decide. So, so anyway, that's there in my freezer, and I hope we can use it somehow. Or we can do it after all the flooding's over, and we can just have that as a good time also for all those. It, the whole county. I don't know. <laughs> those that help. Fourth, that's what <laughs> and, uh, and along with all of that, I just, uh, my, up in Porterville this last weekend on Saturday, I would say there was at least 500 people up there sandbagging and at least a couple of skidsters that were there lifting the pallets and putting them onto trailers and putting them into rows and everything else. And and I very much appreciate everybody that was there because Sunday I was sore. 
and uh, I mean I had my kids out there grandkids were out there helping too so there was a lot of man hours put out on Saturday in whatever locations throughout the county and uh, so anyway um, as far as I think that was enough for now but I would like to go into closed session if we can. Okay. Um, Commissioner Wilson. Um, do we have garbage bags that we would, we could provide for people that wanted to clean up just trash freeways and stuff like that? See why we couldn't get some. Okay. That's a great idea. You yeah, know, when we do the dire as well, there were bags that they provided. And leftover, you We think? won't have dire or swold until about June this year. <laughs> it won't even be I, think so those I don't think those huh? were purchased the by the county. I think that was yeah, purchased the by the. Um, well, it's just the snow and the cold. Well, who is they it? Just the it's the. It's the wheat, the, 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 the soil cons conservation. Soil conservation district. Yeah. 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 But I don't see why we couldn't okay. buy some bags. I, I That's could, a wonderful idea. Okay. All right. I had a family that wanted to do that. I said I'd ask and get approval. So. I guess the next question is, though, are they thinking they'll kind of leave the bags and we'd come around and pick them up at some point? Is that the plan or are they planning on hauling them off? Or um, I'll ask them. Okay. Or provide sure them. That I mean, we have some dumpsters. We, they could bring I'm them sure to or whatever. I'll just tell them where the dumpsters are. And okay. I'll talk to Brad. Okay. Great. And I've met with Melissa several times. Went toward the Red Barn. Wow, what an amazing place that is. I don't know if you that if you I think you have rubber have the you, what was it the red barn yeah what have you tarred barn? that I don't think so which red barn what is the it's, red barn? it's the uh, it's that red barn right there at the Farmington station exit on the right hand side you can oh. see that big red barn there oh, yeah. that's for the for people that is basically their last chance of going to prison for life you know it's like you've got one last chance. And it's a two-year program. Um, I think it could be so well used by our county in certain situations. And you, you basically just spend two years there, up to four years. They've had a pe person stay four years that felt like, Cal, I just don't know if I trust myself yet. But it's free. It's, they provide them a job. They teach them Good they have that restaurant there, the chicken place. Yep. Which is, by the way, is really good food. Yeah. So they have a moving company that they employ with their the, the people. They have the restaurant. Can't think of what it's called. Uh, stick, stick sticky burger. Sticky, sticky burger. Yeah. yeah. Um, a construction company and a uh, clothing store, kind of like a secondhand. I do think store. I listened to. Podcast with the guy who put that thing together, and it was really fascinating. It might have been the other side academy too, because he's a little. That's more, what it was. He's the a other little side more vocal, and yeah, but it's very similar. They had Amazing similar program, though, really. And now he's built that beautiful um, townhomes or apartments right next door to it, those big white ones, and he'll. They can stay in those for five hundred dollars a month because housing is the hardest thing that they have. They can usually find a job, but housing people don't want them. So five hundred dollars a month, he'll let them stay in there, and and then after a year, they pay a portion, a portion of their wages that they're making. So just a great, great, great program. Is that through Davis County, or is that? It's just a, it's just a uh, <coughs> private, it's a private private, treatment private, center. private, private. So, is he getting grants to be able to do it, or what's? How is he? He's he's pretty wealthy himself. <coughs> However, businesses the businesses, fund. that's how he funds it with the okay. businesses, and they work for free, obviously, because they stay there and live there, and they all have their assignments. They cook and clean, and the place is a. It's just. Hmm. They let us open their drawers. I mean, they, they, their, their clothes are in little things, all straight. It's called, it's called folded. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like a military thing in some, some way. But 
they would just call guys to stand up and and it was like they'd just stand up and bear these testimonies of this place like it was just crazy how it changed their life and these are these are guys from 25 years old to I saw a guy now that had to be in his mid 60s yeah. guys that have been in prison seven eight times just crazy so anyway that was cool so meeting with um, I'd like I'll, I'll put on the agenda time to meet with Melissa and discuss the COE we've got some some um, thoughts on that and Different things she did include us in her um, grant, her TANF grant, and so we'll. But if if we get included in that, we would have to be a part of some type of situation there where we're in helping pay because Weber's paying and the county's paying. We don't pay them anything. We donate to Weber Health, Human Services, but we don't help with COE. So anyway, so I'll have that on the agenda, and we'll have her come up and do a presentation for us. We just, um, myself and the public defender, just jointly recommended uh, one of our defendants to go there. Cause a lot of. Um, a lot of work, especially for our victims advocate, because there were there were so many victims in in what he was doing, and he did it multiple times. But um, and the reason he was doing it multiple times is because he would keep getting let out, you know, on probation, and then you reoffend if you haven't kicked the addiction. And a lot of the studies show that an addiction takes about 14 months to like retrain your brain, like different neurological pathways. And so when someone's in jail for 30 days and then they go back out, they're, they go back to what they're used to or what they've been missing for the 30 days, whereas a program like this allows two years, so they're well beyond the 14 months. Plus they develop a skill set, personal accountability, all of that. And a condition of going to the Red Barn is if you leave, because you can voluntarily leave, or if you get kicked out because you're not obeying the rules, then you'll go straight to prison was one of the conditions. And so anyway, I'm going to try and push it for those in our community or, you know, defendants that just have an addiction that continues to come. But we'll see how it goes. That was probably just about six weeks ago that we started that. And so far, so good. They don't, they don't just take anybody. No, you have to request. Yeah. You have to have a desire to go there. Or they, they've never had a fight yet. They, they're really, it's, but they have had some people leave on their own accord, you know. But, Sounds but they, like an amazing program. They may, they immediately call the police and they usually pick them up around the corner and haul them down to the prison. So <laughs> some people can't ever keep walking into the wall. <laughs> But anyway, that's all I have. Other than I, I'm really grateful for our community as well. It's, it's a privilege to live here. Commissioner Anderson, I think you... Yes, so I started. And I again. forgot something too, so... <laughs> we have uh, uh, Commissioner Newton and I have a meeting tomorrow with the Croydon Bridge Project. So we'll get, keep you guys updated on that. We're doing our best to mitigate damages there. Um, also, um, back to what Commissioner Farco was talking about with COG, the two quarter percents that we approved sales tax, they have not uh, shown up yet, but they officially everything will be tracking from April until June, and then we will see those two quarter percents in July. So from a county perspective, we're really going to see a difference in a bump in, in not just the COG dollars, but also Brett's, Brett's money and, and uh, transportation. So. And we need it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah we, we good definitely. timing. Um, the one item I neglected to share was that tomorrow evening, starting at 5 p.m., is the fairgrounds cleanup day. So they're wrangling volunteers to go over and help clean up the fairgrounds. If you've got extra time or know somebody that's got some time, send them over there. Okay. May I ask a question of both of you? Sure. 
the meeting you're having with whoever tomorrow uh, for the bridge, is it including Rob White or not? Okay. Do I need to have a meeting with him now, or shall I postpone that until all this is done? About what? That I, it was just going to be a meeting with him and my concerns about them looking and taking care of Warren County. Oh, just so a general meeting with him? General yeah. meeting. Yeah, I think you can have with him whenever you want. You can, you can have a general meeting yeah. anytime. I mean, we're... Yeah. All right. I will contact him. And okay. Then, Robert, he's still going to join you on Friday. We have a request to move into closed session. Time. Would you like to yeah, I move make that, that we, official motion? I move that we go into closed session for the purpose of character, what was it again? Character competence. Or professional competency or of an individual. Professional competency. And then can we add potential litigation, just a really quick item? Okay, I'm fine with that. You can <laughs> second you. me if you want. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. This is a roll call vote. Commissioner Fackrell? Aye. Commissioner McConnell? Aye. I vote aye. Commissioner Anderson? Aye. And Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Okay, we will move into closed session. And where Following the closed session, it is anticipated that we will adjourn our public.